Testing, three, two, one.
Very good. I'll welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Pasarable City Council for Tuesday, October the 6th. Before we call the meeting to order, I'd like to read the following. In compliance with the state and county sheltered home orders and as allowed by the governor's executive order N-29-20, which allows for a deviation of teleconference rules required by the Ralph M. Brown Act, city council meetings will be held by teleconference only until further notice. Rather than attending in person, a resident should call 805-865-7276 to provide public comment via telephone. The phone line will be open just prior to the start of the closed session meeting and again prior to the start of the regular meeting. Written public comments can be submitted by email to cityclerk at prcity.com prior to 12 noon on the day of the council meeting to be posted as an addendum to the agenda. If submitting written comments in advance of the meeting, please note the agenda item by number or name. City council meetings will be live streamed during the meeting and also available to play later on YouTube by accessing www.prcity.com forward slash YouTube. With that, I will call the meeting to order and invite everyone to mute their microphones with the exception of Council Strong, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. With me, please, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman Strong. Our invocation tonight is scheduled to be delivered by Pastor Pat Sheehan. Pastor Sheehan, are you with us? Yes. Father in heaven, your name is holy. We ask your blessings upon those who lead us through these challenging times. May you keep them in health and bless them with wisdom and understanding for every decision. Lord God, we remember with thanksgiving our former council member and planner, Ed Steinbeck, who is home with you now. Bring your comfort to his family and to those of us who knew him. Father, watch over and be with our law enforcement officers who bravely put their lives at risk to keep law and order in our community. Father, we especially remember Deputy Nicholas Dreyfus and Richard Ted Lenhoff this evening. Speed their recovery and bring comfort and peace to their families. And Lord, in this very unusual year, please be with our firefighters who have been stretched beyond anything we've seen in recent years. Protect them throughout the great state of California as they battle to save us from these fires. Thank you for your blessings upon our city, and may you continue to bless each and every one. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. May we have a roll call, please? Council Member Garcia? Here. Council Member Gregory? Here. Council Member Hammond? Here. Council Member Strong? Here. And Mayor Martin? Here. All members of the Pastoral City Council are present. We we'll move on now to staff introductions, a time set aside so that we can uh, allow the people who are working for the city to introduce themselves so we all know who's online and who will be participating in tonight's meeting. Warren Frace, Community Development Director. With me tonight is David Athey, the City Engineer, Darren Nash, our City Planner, and Katie Bannister, our Associate Planner. And Christopher Leckel with Public Works. With me tonight is Didis Esperanza, our Capital Projects Engineer. Kristen Ferravanti, uh, Capital Projects Engineering Support, and Roger Oxborough, our Airport Manager. Julie Dolan, Community Services Director, joined by Linda Plesha, Recreation Services Manager. Ty Lewis, Police Chief, and I'm joined with Dispatcher Kate McKinley and Sergeant Ricky Lear. Jonathan Stornetta, Fire Chief, and I'm joined with Battalion Chief, Fire Marshal Randy Harris. Ryan Cornell, uh, Administrative Services Director. Sarah Johnson Rios, Assistant City Manager, joined by Dave McHugh, IT Manager, Melissa Martin, Interim City Clerk, Shauna Howenstein, Civic Engagement Coordinator, and Paul Sloan, Economic Development Manager. Kimberly Hood, Interim City Attorney. Tom Fritchie, City Manager, joined by Caleb Davis, Police Commander. Thank you, one and all. 
Prior to the open session, we had an advertised closed session meeting of the Pastoral City Council. I'll ask the city attorney if there was any reportable action. Now the council convened in closed session for one item on a conference of labor negotiators with the unrepresented uh, groups and labor unions identified on the agenda and provided direction, but there's no reportable action. Thank you. Moving on to presentations, we have two presentations tonight. These are information items that do not require any council action. First up, we have our COVID-19 community update, Emergency Services Chief Jonathan Stratton. Good evening, Mayor Martin, members of the council. If we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. As of today, the state has just over 826,000 positive cases, which is an increase of approximately 69,000 new cases since my last report to the council. Total deaths in the state have risen to 16,149, an increase of over 1,700 new deaths since our last report. The statewide positivity rate has decreased by 0.2%, to an overall total of 3.2%. This is the lowest rate since the state began reporting the data in late March. Next slide, please. The Pass Robles region remains at the top for most cases in the county at 913. San Luis Obispo County cases total 3,755. Of those, 198 of those cases remain active. As of today, three remain hospitalized and no patients are in the ICU. Next slide, please. Today is the two-week mark for being in the red tier. Our testing positivity rate is at 1.9%, but we remain in the red tier due to our case rates per 100,000, which remains at 5.1. This is our lowest case rate since the week of July 1 and the lowest testing positivity rate we have seen thus far. Today, Dr. Borenstein affirmed that San Luis Obispo County Schools K-12 through have the option to reopen for modified in-person instruction in accordance with the state's COVID-19 blueprint for a safer economy. Prior to reopening, local schools must submit a plan for modified in-person instruction to the county health officer for review and consultation. Schools are not required to reopen. Once, reopen, once the schools reopen, they can remain open even if we move back to the purple tier. That concludes the situational report. I'll turn it over to our assistant city manager, Ms. Johnson Rios, to talk about updates in the city's response to COVID-19. Thank you, Chief Starnetta. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we gave more regular presentations to council and, and the community about how city services were continuing to be provided in different ways and how the city was coordinating with key stakeholders and keeping the community informed about COVID-19. Now, almost seven months into the pandemic, many of those efforts are still underway and there are now some new changes to report on as we work our way through the state's relatively new four-tier system. So as part of these presentations, we'll be bringing back some updates and highlights um, of the city's response efforts. Uh, one example of the, the ways in which staff is finding creative ways to serve the public is Paso Play on Wheels. Um, which was launched by the Recreation Services Division last Friday. It's a mobile recreation program focused on keeping children in Paso Robles active and engaged while they're distance learning. This is presented in partnership with the school district. Actually, some of the online resources that community services staff created, including Be Well Paso and Virtual Paso, helped allow the school district to qualify for grant funding, and they were able to distribute over 500 heat and serve dinners to Paso families each week. As a part of that, Paso Play on Wheels is visiting the school meal distribution sites to give away free recess kits to children. So last Friday, city staff distributed 150 kits at Winifred Piper Elementary School. The kits contained a Frisbee, sidewalk chalk, and other items to encourage kids to stay active. The next giveaway will be on November 6th at Georgia Brown. Founding sponsors for this program include the Paso Robles Rec Foundation, Paso Pediatric Dental, and uh, in-kind sponsorship from Cali Kids Fitness. You can find more information on the schedule of distributions on the city's website. Next slide, please. In addition, ongoing COVID-19 communications efforts are still underway. Uh, you may have seen banners across Spring Street at city facilities and signage in city parks encouraging residents and visitors to help us keep Paso safe and healthy. We've also distributed table tents to downtown restaurants and we're working on additional signage for key public spaces currently. 
Um, our open and safe flyers, just wanna make sure everyone is aware that we do have a PASO specific uh, open and safe flyer that we developed in coordination with community stakeholder groups so that PASO businesses can display um, this PASO specific information campaign with the aim of being able to keep PASO businesses open while keeping the PASO community safe. Regular coordination with stakeholder groups is still ongoing and the mayor has recently formed a COVID-19 coalition of volunteers whose aim is to create a community driven effort to slow the spread of COVID-19 in addition to what the city organization um, is able to do. Next slide, please. The city's website is continually updated with the latest COVID-19 resource information. So just wanted to remind folks that you can find information about city services and how those evolve, continue to evolve during COVID-19. Um, testing information, which is also changing regularly, business and community resources, virtual library content, wellness programming, volunteer opportunities, and a whole lot more resources. So if you haven't visited in a while, we encourage you to take a look. Next slide, please. Um, and ongoing business support is, is still underway. So just a few recent highlights. Um, as we reported at the last meeting, the um, small business grant program distributed $200,000 in federal CARES Act funds directly to local businesses impacted by the pandemic. And we wanted to highlight today, um, two of the 33 businesses that were originally awarded actually declined their grants and asked that they instead be reallocated to other businesses, which um, we've done this week. And so we just think that truly demonstrates the collaborative ethos of the Paso community. And um, this was a really great program that um, federal funding helped us be able to, to do. Um, and then I just wanted to mention for any businesses that are still seeking assistance, within the last week or two, we learned that the Southland Economic Development Corporation is now offering low interest loans, um, specifically to slow county businesses impacted by the pandemic. There's more information about that on the city's website as well. Outdoor dining continues to support local restaurants via both dining in the park, which has accommodated patrons consuming over 10,000 meals to date. And that's really a community collaborative effort um, with a lot of the stakeholder groups and through through dining on public or private right of way. Um, wanted to let folks know that staff recently developed guidelines to allow outdoor dining to continue into the winter months with safe uh, guidelines for use of outdoor heaters or tents. And finally, we want to just um, congratulate and thank residents for the progress that the community has collectively made to date at moving us from the purple tier into the red tier. We want to encourage people to keep taking the precautions that are working as we head into the winter months in particular. And we wanted to highlight that there's a new no cost testing resource in Paso Robles at the event center. It's now open uh, on an ongoing basis, Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And um, it is no cost for folks, even if whether or not you have health insurance. So um, that is a new resource uh, within, I, I believe it started this week um, or last week. So we encourage um, residents to take advantage of that Available uh, availability locally. That concludes tonight's presentation. Chief Starnett and I are available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I just want to tag on to that report from the coalition that I've been working with of citizens who are sending information to our community. We had our first Zoom meeting last night, and some of the points discussed were utilizing that Paso Strong compliance poster and turning it into an online logo that participating businesses can display on their website so that when people um, when people surf the web looking for businesses in Paso, they can tell immediately which ones are in compliance and open and safe. Uh, we have a citizen that has um, offered to produce signage for us. If we produce areas for the signs to go up, we're in conversation about doing that now. Uh, we outlined all of the resources that uh, you heard outlined tonight and the uh, places where people can go to get COVID-19 resources. Uh, we're uh, doing a renewed effort for Spanish translation of uh, these items. We, we want to get a more colloquial translation, something that's more accessible to the public, and we're working on that. And then anybody that would like to sign up or would like to learn more about the Citizens Coalition, there's a form at my website, which I keep at my expense, PasoMayor.com. 
With that, uh, this is not an action item. It is an information item. I will ask the council if there are any questions. Mr. Gregory. Yes, uh, Mayor Martin, I had a question on how do the businesses reach out to get on that website or have that website be on their own? Uh, on the compliance website? Yes. Okay, so uh, the as I understand it, the chamber has been keeping a list of businesses that are complying and as one of the agencies distributing this uh, open and safe for business. The discussion we had last night was to convert that into a logo, a badge that these individual businesses would be able to put on their websites to tell customers that they are compliant. Just another way of getting the, the message out. So they could reach out to the chamber to get that on their website? Uh, it hasn't been developed yet. We just talked about it last night, but I would imagine in the next day or two, that'll be the case. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jonathan, um, you kind of ran over the, uh, the level that we're at currently. What's it going to take to get down to the next level? And that is assuming that's countywide, not just local, isn't it? That is, that's countywide. So um, the testing positivity rate, obviously, we're at 1.9%, which would allow us to move to the next category. But the one that remains highest still is our case rates per thousand, and we're at 5.1. So we need to be below 3.9 to move down to the orange stage. I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Strong? Yes, no questions. Thank you. Ms. Garcia? No questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have one final question. Uh, uh, quite often I get the inquiry about the source of the infection rate. Obviously, since the beginning of the pandemic, 93446, that zip code encompassing the city of Paso Robles, has unfortunately been leading the pack on infections. And I think there's a natural uh, concern um, that uh, our tourism industry may be driving that. Uh, Mr. Stornetta, my understanding is from the public health office, there is not a direct correlation between tourism to date and the infection rate. It's more of a community spread. Is that correct? It is. It's more of a community and person to person spread. And just remember that the Paso includes the whole region of the 93446 area. And additionally, they do have stats for tourism and they're very low. So like I said, the highest indicators are community transmission and person to person. Very good. And as soon as that information is developed for businesses to display on their website, we can start getting that out. And people that have any question at all, rather than rifling around on the internet, all they have to do is go to that website, see that badge, and know that they're complying and, and keeping the public safe while they have their businesses open. Is there anyone in the public standing by to make a comment on this report? No, sir. Very good. Then we'll move on. Thank you very much for that information. A lot of stuff going on in response to COVID. Uh, item number two under presentations, we have police department recognition presented by our police chief, Mr. Ty Lewis. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I have a couple people in the room with me and we should be getting a third one coming down the stairs any minute. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, we're broadcasting live from the police department. I'm Police Chief Ty Lewis. Uh, to my right, I have Sergeant Ricky Lear. And also a little bit further to my right, which coming over here, is uh, Dispatcher Kate McKinley. Come on into the frame, everybody. There we go. And I have uh, Battalion Chief Randy Harris. So uh, I'm honored tonight to be able to uh, present some awards. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to read to everybody uh, our, you know, how this all came about. And I think it's something that the community should be familiar with, um, but uh, some of the details might not be quite known to everybody. So here's a, here's a little memorandum that was writ written to me uh, from our department regarding uh, these awards tonight. In the early morning of June 10th, 2020, the city of Paso Robles was awakened to the sounds of gunfire in our downtown corridor. Four Paso Robles Police Department officers and dispatcher Kate McKinley were working the mor that morning and immediately began calling for additional resources to assist with locating and stopping a gunman outside the police department. In the cover of darkness, the lone gunman traversed his way through the downtown area, firing multiple gunshots at officers and the public safety center. Dispatcher McKinley was working as a solo dispatcher that morning when she was monitoring the security camera footage surrounding the public safety center and noticed the man outside the police department with a gun in his hand. Dispatch McKinley quickly alerted officers of the suspect's location and movement around the public safety center. 
Dispatcher McKinley also notified the Paso Robles Police Department and the emergency services personnel who were headed back to the station after a call for service, advising the firefighters to stay, to stay away from the, the department. Although she may not have known it at the time, she undoubtedly saved the lives of many firemen. Dispatch McKinley, McKinley continuously gathered information and directed assisting agencies, including the California Highway Patrol, the Atascadero Police Department, and the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's uh, Department to assist us. Shots continued to be fired by the suspect throughout our downtown as additional officers arrived. Shortly after 3.53 in the morning, the suspect again shot at the officers from the corner of 10th and Park Streets, directly in front of the police department. About this time, two San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's deputies arrived to help establish a perimeter around the downtown corridor. Sergeant Ricky Lear was called at home to assist with officers um, in, 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 back at the Public Safety Center. Without hesitation, Sergeant Lear, who was fast asleep at the time, immediately responded to the Public Safety Center. As assisting law enforcement agencies were responding, Battalion Chief Randy Harris also responded and began to establish a, a command post near the fairgrounds. At 4.25 in the morning, the words no officer, dispatcher, or firefighter ever wanted to hear echoed over our radio. Officer down. The suspect is shot Nick, Deputy Nick Dreyfus, who was positioned with his partner, Deputy Pacas, near 10th and Riverside. At 427, Sergeant Lear arrived to Deputy Dreyfus's location. Sergeant Lear was only wearing his civilian clothing. He just driving in, drove into work in his personally owned vehicle. Despite hearing active gunfire, Sergeant Lear rushed to help Deputy Pacas and wounded Deputy Dreyfus. He was only wearing sweatpants, sandals, and a t-shirt. Yet Sergeant Lear selflessly jumped into action to save Deputy Dreyfus. Undoubtedly, due, his training, due to his training as a former United States Marine, Sergeant Lear never contemplated his own safety when he jumped into action. Sergeant Lear removed his T-shirt and immediately applied pressure to Deputy uh, Dreyfus's face, which um, was where the wound was. Sergeant Lear then immediately worked to remove Deputy Dreyfus from the scene and use the deputy's radio to help coordinate incoming medical units. Simultaneous to all this, Battalion Chief Randy Harris also jumped into action and immediately coordinated Deputy Dreyfus's rescue. With route regard for his own safety, Battalion Chief Harris drove by himself into the unsecured area where he and Sergeant Lear placed Deputy Dreyfus into Chief Harris's SUV for immediate care and transport. Battalion Chief Harris's heroic, selfless actions allowed him to get Deputy Dreyfus to safety where life-saving medical attention was obtained. It is it for these reasons that I'm making the following presentations. First, Deputy, excuse me, Dispatcher Kate McKinley. Kate is receiving tonight the Bronze Medal of Valor. Dispatcher McKinley's composure while tracking the suspect on camera, updating officers with the shooter's location, fielding numerous calls from the community, and arriving officers undoubtedly saved the lives of officers and firefighters. Dispatch McKinley manifested outstanding bravery in the performance of duty. Okay, you're the first one here this evening. You get the Medal of Valor. Comes with a pin that you can place on your uniform. And also, this is an awesome keepsake that you'll be able to cherish. Congratulations. Next. This one is, uh, we don't have a, a, a medal for firefighters, since they're not part of our, uh, our sworn contingent here. But we share a building, and so we came up with the closest thing that we could based upon our policy which is the Citizens Award of Valor. Chief Harris, this is um, for you tonight. Without regard for your own safety, you put yourself in harm's way to, re to rescue Deputy Dreyfus. You coordinated life-saving rescue, and without a doubt, you saved Officer Dreyfus, or excuse me, Deputy Dreyfus's life. So with that, Chief, we have an award for you also. <laughs> And again, this is the highest award that we can give to a 
civilian. So this is the award of valor for you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. And last but certainly not least, Sergeant Ricky Lear. In an act of outstanding bravery, Sergeant Lear ignored his own safety to save the life of Deputy Dreyfus. Sergeant Lear remained in the battle despite not having proper personal safety equipment. He stayed to protect Deputy Pacas until relieved, never once thinking of himself. Sergeant Lear's actions were above and beyond the call of duty and is commended at the highest level with the gold medal of valor. For those of you that are out in the community this evening, uh, this is a very special time. We don't uh, give these uh, awards out very often. They're truly reserved for um, those special heroes in our organizations. And uh, this event rocked our community, rocked our departments. And uh, I'm, I'm truly proud uh, to be your police chief and to work with you, Randy, and, and uh, Chief Stornetta. And so uh, I ask the community and those out there to give a round of applause uh, for, for some of my favorite people. Thank you, and that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Chief. Uh, before they leave, uh, I want to give each member of the council the opportunity to say something to these folks because we give out uh, a lot of recognitions over the course of the year, and they're all well-deserved. But this truly is something special, and I think we need to take a moment to reflect on that. So um, I'll call on council members in turn to uh, express their, their, their thoughts. Mr. Gregory? Um, I'd like to give you the most heartfelt thank you to all of you. Um, <clears throat> it's very special to be able to jump in and save a life, and uh, it's the highest award, I think that anybody can do is share your life to help someone else save their life. And I can just say thank you from my heart and your true path for opens all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just uh, want to encourage everyone to do a little shout out to these two people and everyone who took part in this whole effort to keep us safe. Uh, Dispatcher McKinley under fire. I mean, you were very calm. I think you did your, your father proud obviously your family as well so congratulations and randy i mean to to run toward the gunfire again it's pretty unique and we appreciate that support same way with the other officers that all responded it was really quite an effort we appreciate it thank you very much thank you mr strong yes and i offer my personal congratulations and commendations to every one of you it is every bit as brave as any soldier in any battle in any war that we have ever fought. And your bravery is outstanding and an example to every human being. And thank you so much. Please never leave us. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Yes, sir. Thank you. My heart is filled with so much gratitude right now that it is so heavy right now that I just appreciate everything, all the efforts from everybody and you are truly our superheroes every day you know we thank god for to wake up every day and to keep going but it's because of you guys that are out there taking care of us that we can maintain that i appreciate it and thank you so much and for myself um i i find my appreciation exceeds my ability to express it in words uh, every day we talk about the people that keep us safe. We talk about the people that sacrifice to make sure that our city is secure. And then when something like this happens, it's the real test. And you folks pass with flying colors. And we are so proud of the fact that you were here in our time of need and that you were there in the time of need of your fellow officers and your fellow first responders. So again, thank you. The rewards are just uh, justly deserved, and we hope that uh, you take them as a, just a token of our appreciation for the work you do for our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, we come now to the portion of our agenda set aside for general public comments. This is a time when people have the opportunity to make a comment or ask a question about an issue that does not appear on tonight's agenda. If it does appear on the agenda tonight, there will be a separate time set aside for public comment when that item is heard. Uh, we ask that if you're going to speak, if you please give your name so everyone listening in will know who is speaking. And also, if you would take three minutes to express yourself, uh, that would be helpful. So I am looking to see if we have anyone in line here. I see no callers for general public comment. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Thank you very much. We will move on then. I will ask the city manager now, do we have any agenda items to be deferred this evening? No, sir, we do not. We come now to our consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered routine, not requiring separate discussion. However, if discussion is wanted by a member of the council or public, the item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Council members and members of the public may offer comments or ask questions of clarification without removing an item from the calendar. Individual items are approved by the vote that approves the consent calendar unless an item is pulled for separate consideration. And if an item is pulled for separate consideration, it is our usual policy to place that item at the end of the meeting. With that, I will ask city council members if they have questions or they want items removed uh, from the consent calendar. Mr. Gregory? I just have one question so for clarification. Sure. The addendum we received for the item number six is just exhibit A added to that so we can review that. Is that correct? That is correct. It, the version of the actual amendment in your packet was a placeholder because the final wording had not been fully worked out. So you now have the final wording. Very good. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The only question I had was on uh, item three, the, the city council meeting uh, minutes from September 15th, our last meeting, in particular item 15. And there was some, the way it's written, I have some clarification. Uh, that I'm going to talk about council comments to see if we have further. No, I love you. I love you too. I had a good oh, There's food and stuff in here, Mary. If yeah, everyone who is not speaking, right. mute your microphones, please. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll be doing this up in uh, council comments further, but um, I just want some more clarification on the actual motion. Very good. Okay. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. On item number four, our ward warrant register. It's a very lengthy document, actually 63 pages, and is generally misunderstood by most people because it just looks like a lot of, lot of numbers. But it's very meaningful because it lets the public know how much of our public funds are being spent on their behalf. But it, what it doesn't do is show how much is actually coming from the general fund uh, by itself, and, and that's significant because it was only slightly uh, uh, more than a, a million dollars this last uh, period. And the other thing is, it doesn't show that of that money, how much of it was actually money generated by our citizens through their taxes and fees, and how much was from other agencies or donations or grants that uh, did not cost our citizens anything. And I think um, those are very important figures that somehow we should include and in, at least in the summary report or somehow let people know. I think I think those are great points. Actually, it's something I was going to bring up a lot of what you said under council comments. So I think we might have a little discussion later. Uh, Councilwoman Garcia. No, sir, no questions. Thank you. I don't see anyone in queue. Do we have anybody in the public who would like to speak? No, sir. Very good. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar, please. Mayor, Mayor Martin, Steve Gregory, I'd like to move that we approve items three through 13 on the consent agenda. Councilman Strong second. seconds. I have a motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Strong. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Gregory. Aye. Councilmember Garcia? Aye. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Councilmember Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. 
Motion passes 5-0. I want to remind everyone listening in that uh, the city agenda and all the linked reports are available online at prc.com prior to our meetings. For those who have not had the chance to look at that, uh, I would like to ask the city manager to please give us a short report on the consent calendar action tonight so people listening in know what actions we've taken. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item three was approval of the city council minutes from September 15th, and that is an important action because that is the official record, official legal record of what took place at that meeting. Item number four, as was indicated by Mr. Strong, is the warrant register, and those are the checks that the city writes to pay for the goods and services it purchases to provide the services we do. And this warrant register covered three weeks, a total of $2 million, 700,000 of which was for the water fund, 130,000 of which was for the wastewater fund. So there's slightly over a million dollars that's for the general fund and capital projects. And of that 250,000 was for utility costs. Item number five was the advisory body minutes and the council doesn't receive these minutes, but since these are advisory bodies to the council, the draft minutes come to the council to give the council an opportunity to weigh in if appropriate. And this council meeting, you had minutes from the senior citizen advisory committee, the parks and recreation advisory committee, and the downtown parking advisory commission. Item number six was approval of a third amendment and agreement for the airport solar project. And the purpose of this amendment was that due to delays in approval of the project from the FAA, the milestones in the original agreement needed updating. And so that's happening with the action tonight. Item number seven was the authorization for the fire chief to enroll the city in the federal excess personal property program. And that is an opportunity for the city to receive on loan for free uh, surplus federal equipment especially that that um, enables wildfire suppression um, capabilities. So thanks to the chief for doing that. It's a way to expand our capabilities without any expenditure of city resources or resident resources. Item number eight was the acceptance of a regional fire prevention safety trailer grant award. And this is now four for four for the fire department and um, within the last few weeks, the council has approved four grant grants that the department applied for and has been awarded. And the department did this on behalf of all of the fire agencies in the region. And it's $107,000 without any city match for a regional interactive fire prevention education program. And along with item seven, the previous item, it's just an example of how much effort staff undertakes to find additional resources. Item number nine was the approval and agreement with pavement engineering. And we do this annually to ensure that the contractors doing our annual and special um, street work do it to acceptable standards. And so this is for the annual work being done for fiscal year 2021. And the contract is with pavement engineering Inc to provide those services. Item number 10 was the approval of construction contract with Paso Robles tank and also with um, advantage technical services for managing the engineering phase. Now that the West Side Reservoir is operational, the water division will be taking one of the two East Side tanks above Golden Hill Road offline for maintenance and repair. And this is a periodic requirement in order to keep the tank in um, serviceable shape and to ensure that the inside coatings of the tank uh, remain fully with full integrity. Item number 11 was the approval of a construction agreement for protection of the Minari, Minari trunk sewer. And this is one of the ma city's major sewer lines. It runs near the high school and it is adjacent to some stormwater culverts that as a result of some of the uh, more uh, larger rainstorms we've had have caused erosion and damage to the culverts. And in order to prevent damage to the sewer main itself, uh, the Stormwater culverts will be repaired and the slopes will be stabilized under this contract. Item number 12 was the acceptance of an office traffic safety grant. And this is another opportunity that city staff took to bring in outside resources to assist us. This was an effort by the police department. Actually, it's two grants, two interrelated grants. One is for traffic enforcement equipment. And the second is for overtime for staff to undertake enforcement efforts to, to prevent um, drunk driving, driving under the influence, 
and other types of any inappropriate um, traffic actions. And the grant total was for 67,000. And then finally, under item 13, the council approved an update to the senior volunteer services uh, contract. And as the council knows, since 2012, we have been contracting with senior volunteer services to provide the services from our senior center. And the current contract ran through this past July, but with COVID-19, it was a great opportunity to rethink that contract. And as a result of negotiations by Linda Plesha and Judy Dolan, uh, senior volunteer services is going to be moving their corporate offices into our senior center, which provides additional hours of coverage provides additional volunteer opportunities for our seniors. Um, it is at some increased cost, but still significant savings from what uh, we were paying prior to the initiation of the contract in 2012. And that, Mr. Mayor, is uh, the summary of all the items approved tonight by the Council on Consent. Thank you very much. We move now to public hearings. Item number 14, the Beachwood Specific Plan, P12-0002, Mr. Fritz. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Warren Frace, Community Development Director. This item before us tonight is a Beachwood specific plan. This is a public hearing. This is an application for a general plan amendment, zoning map amendment, a 911 unit specific plan, an oak tree removal permit, a large lot vesting tenant track map, and a development agreement, all covered by an EIR. So a quick overview of just who uh, the members of the team is for both the city and the applicant. So the city staff team, um, as I said, I'm Warren Frace, I'm the community development director. With us tonight is Darren Nash, our city planner, Katie Bannister, our city assistant planner, David Athey, the city engineer, Christopher Aleckles representing public works as a public works director. We have both Kimberly Hood, the city attorney, and then Matt Summers, which is our contract city attorney, who was the lead on the development agreement uh, preparation. Brandy Cummins is our contract city planner. Uh, Linda Korska is our EIR consultant. Joe Fernandez is on the line. She, he's our city traffic consultant, prepared all the traffic analysis for this project. And then Kuda Wawaki um, is our fiscal consultant and did all the fiscal analysis for the city. And then the project applicant team um, consists of Dan Lloyd. He's the representative for the applicants. We have multiple property owners represented in the project area, including Ray and Mike Herod, Tom Erskine, Jay Hubner, Carl Wittstrom, and John and Phil Kali. Cagallero, excuse me. Um, land use planners is Lisa Wise and Jeff Barfield. Um, their attorneys and fiscal consultants are Andrew Fogg and John Zimmerman. They're in the council chamber tonight with Ray Herod and Dan Lloyd. And then their civil engineering teams include Tom Martin and Nate Strong from Rick Engineering, Christy, Christy Gabler from Kirk Consulting, and then Rob Miller from Wallace Group. So an overview in terms of the process that's gotten us here tonight, um, we've had a number of different committees um, and commissions review this to get to this point. Um, the council did appoint a specific plan ad hoc committee a few years ago to review specific plans, including this one. They've met uh, multiple times to review this project and they have endorsed the specific plans, both its designs and its policies. This project's also been reviewed by the City Parks and Rec Committee um, in a public meeting. They have recommended approval of the community park in the project as well as the trail system. The Planning Commission held a public hearing in August on the project. They are recommending approval of the entire project and all the entitlements to the City Council. So the City Councilman, Council's role tonight is to hold a public hearing and then to make a final decision on the project before you tonight. Public outreach has been a very important part of the project. Um, we've had 12 different public outreach opportunities for public participation um, since 2018, starting with an open house and concluding tonight with uh, the city council meeting. This meeting tonight, um, we have large boards that we've placed all over the site um, to notify the neighbors. In addition, we've notified anyone living within a thousand feet of the site, as well as provided notices in the newspaper and on the internet. 
So in terms of the package of entitlements, um, if you go to page 189 of your staff report, that'll lay out um, the decision points tonight. There are five resolutions and two ordinances that will be decision points, and we'll go over those as we move through the presentation. So where's the project located? Um, the project's located on the southeastern side of town off of Creston Road. Um, it's this area here. It's known as the Beachwood Specific Plan Area. This is an area that was annexed to the city and zoned for single family residential back in 2004. So as we zoom in, you can kind of see the location a little bit better. So it's east of Beachwood. Um, south of Meadowlark and then north of Creston Road. This is the uh, PG&E power lines basically uh, make up the eastern boundary of the project area. So a little bit of context for how this project fits in with overall city goals. As you'll recall, the city uh, council conducted a strategic planning session in 2018, identified the key um, goals for the city, um, those that included housing and economic development, expansion of city infrastructure, maintenance of community character and quality of life, and then community engagement and participation. Um, I think you'll see as we go through the presentation that this project has hit all four of those points very well. Housing is an important uh, important um, goal for the city. Um, historically, the city of Paso Robles produced uh, up to 500 annual single-family residential units. Um, you can see in 2007 that production dropped off drastically with the recession and really hasn't recovered ever since. Last year, um, we only issued 35 housing permits. Um, that's not enough to keep up with the needs of the community or support economic development within the community and the needs for local businesses and job creation. And if you look at, at the details of the housing production, you'll actually see that the majority of those houses, housing units produced over the last couple of years actually were apartments which is a good thing, um, the Blue Oak Apartments and then the Oak Park Redevelopment Project comprised about 400 units over the last five years. But single family literally has been um, in the range of 20 to 30 units per year since the recession. So it's very important that we provide housing. Um, it helps for balancing our economics and demographics, um, providing for families of all needs. Um, we've seen family household sides declining over time. We are seeing families being squeezed out of the market. Our Chamber of Commerce and business community has identified the need for housing is very important to supporting job and economic growth in the community. Where we don't have adequate housing, we also see overcrowding, especially service workers will end up um, overcrowding units, which is something that needs to be avoided. And then most importantly, our next generation of um, residents, um, we really need to provide for those kids that live here in town, give them the opportunity to stay here. So how do we do that? We do that by planning through the general plan. Um, the general plan lays out our long-term goals for housing. So we have approximately plans for three to 4,000 additional housing units. Those are allocated across what we call specific plan areas. So this map here, those colored areas, are the um, seven specific plan areas that are identified for housing development in the future. So tonight we're talking about the Beachwood specific plan area to the south um, east there. So this is the project that we're looking at tonight, Beachwood specific plan. It's a 234 acre site. The majority of the site will be designated for single family residential. That'll be both attached and detached ownership products for a total of 911 units. In addition, there's 100 multifamily um, rental apartment units that are part of the project. And then along Creston Road and the extension of Airport Road, there's a mixed use neighborhood commercial center that will allow for a combination of both um, rental apartments and commercial uses on the same sites. And then, as I mentioned, the Parks and Rec Committee looked at and recommended a community park. So this would be a park that serves this whole side of town, including the project area. 
So this eight acre park would include both um, youth baseball fields, soccer fields, um, a playground, and a bathroom. So it would be a facility that's been identified as a need. The Parks and Rec Committee um, basically um, said this was a high priority for this whole side of town. There we go. In addition, um, there's another 20 acres of open space. So this would be passive open space areas, oak and hillside preserves, um, and areas where we'll have trails and little neighborhood pocket um, facilities. There's also the PG&E easement that's on the east side of the project area. That's 26 acres. That'll be preserved. That would be consistent with your Purple Belt agricultural buffer policies. In terms of infrastructure, um, Airport Road, which is our major uh, north-south arterial slated for the east side of town, this will provide a key connection from the existing segments of Airport Road um, up here at Meadowlark down to Creston Road, and this will then connect to the Chandler Olson specific plan extensions of Airport Road. And then trails, um, there'll be 3.8 miles of multi-use trails, including what we are referring to as the Grand Loop Trail that come, picks up the Charlet Trail. That'll bring that up to Creston and then up Airport Road and connect to Olson South Chandler, which then will take it up um, toward Barney Schwartz Park in the future. In addition, there's a series of internal neighborhood connectors that connect to that Grand Loop Trail. So you'll see that we have a full system of trails for both bikes and pedestrians throughout the project area. Um, there were some questions at Planning Commission about the distribution of lot sizes. Um, this graphic basically shows that we have a full range of lot sizes, everything from about 5,300 square feet up to 13,000 square feet, which is over a quarter acre. So there's a variety of different lot sizes, which will then accommodate a number of different um, buyer pro profiles as well. So this really is um, kind of a prototypical Paso Robles suburban neighborhood. So it really builds on the character of the community where we have single family neighborhoods integrated with recreation trails um, and nice landscaping, good uh, neighborhood architectural design. Project um, is in three phases. Um, the phasing is going to basically start from the north and go to the south. Um, the sewers available up here on Metal Arc Road, so that um, will make this the likely first phase. So phase 1A is the pink area, and then phase 1B is the gray area. Either one of these could go first, although we expect 1A probably to go first. The park would be included in that area. Um, the park slated to start by the 250th unit, so that was a recommendation that the Planning Commission made. That's been incorporated into the development agreement. And then the yellow area um, is phase 2. So the development process, um, in terms of how this project's going to roll out and be built, so today, what we're talking about is a specific plan. So what that is, is um, that is the policies and overall concept for the de development of this area. So this will include the architectural design guide guidelines, the landscape design guidelines, there's conceptual grading included, and then tonight there's also the large lot track map that basically lays out the larger planning areas and then um, identifies or provides for the dedication of the backbone road. That's the first step. That's what we're dealing with now. After that, there'll be a second level of development entitlements that come through. Um, this will include the small lot map. So all these sub areas will come back at a future date with um, their small lot maps. That's when the precise track grading will be worked out consistent with the uh, specific plan. And we'll have the individual development plans that basically consistent with the guidelines provide for the architecture, the site plans, and the landscape plans. And then this is what turns into the actual construction project um, that we'll issue the building permits on. 
So design guidelines um, is a key part of the specific plan. The Planning Commission did a lot of work on this section and they've recommended some enhancements that have all been incorporated now into the specific plan. That's Appendix A on page 748 of the staff report. Um, so you'll see that the guidelines look very similar to the guidelines we have for the Uptown Town Center specific plan. That was a request that the Planning Commission made. There's four types of residential design, Mediterranean, farmhouse, contemporary, and craftsman um, that would be allowed under the project and then these guidelines um, provide templates for what those units would look like. Um, that'll come back through DRC and Planning Commission for final approval. All right, grading. Um, there's been some questions raised about grading. Just wanted to go over that really quickly. Um, so this is your existing conditions in the site. So any areas um, that basically don't have a color overlay have slopes less than 5%. So you can see within this project area, probably 80 to 90% of the site is less than 5% slope. The green areas um, are basically 5 to 10% slope areas. Once you see the kind of the yellow and the orange areas, um, that's when you're getting into the 15, 20% slope. So you can see the majority of the site is fairly slow fairly flat. Um, there's some kind of steeper slopes here kind of around um, this little knoll that's being preserved as open space. There's also a number of oak trees here. And then there's a little tight spot right here down on Creston Road. So the specific plan did um, analyze the grading. This is basically, I think, what you'd consider the worst case scenario. I think as the tentative track maps come through, um, they can probably fine tune and reduce the grading below this. So this is kind of your worst case scenario. But even still, you can see through this what we call a heat map that shows the maximum cuts and fills, that the vast majority of the site um, has cuts and fills in the five foot range. So although there's a lot of earth moving because this is a large um, mass graded project. The overall cut and fill is very well designed and balanced. We really just have some very minor spots where we have kind of um, the need to move, you know, more than five feet. And then there's cross sections provided um, that basically show where retaining walls go. Um, most of the walls are kind of in the six foot range where walls are needed, but the majority of the site doesn't even require retaining walls. Okay, general plan amendment. Um, this is part of your application. Um, we are making an amendment to the land use um, element. So this is what the new general plan land use diagram would look like for the site. You can see the yellow, the single family areas, the brown areas are your higher density, um, single family and multifamily areas, your neighborhood commercial mixed use down here on um, Creston Road. The project originally, um, this area was identified for 634 units, I believe. Um, 674 units. Thanks, Dan. Um, there has been a request um, to increase the density of the project. In 2013, the council identified that there was 594 surplus density units that were available that could be reallocated through the city. On May 15th of 2018, the city council did reserve 237 of those surplus units um, for the Beechwood specific plan, which would allow the project to uh, be built out at 911 units. The council also gave direction to prepare the EIR for 911 units. For the past two years, that's the project that we've moved through the process for review. That is um, what's being recommended by the Planning Commission is the 911 unit project. In terms of general plan text amendments, there's a minor change to policy 2G. Um, we're just changing um, the number of units in the Beechwood specific plan area from 674 to 911. There's a second page to land use um, policy 2G that remains unchanged. We're making changes to the zoning map. It'll basically match um, what's shown on the general plan map. We're adding specific plan overlay number five, which is the Beachwood specific plan area. Large lot tentative track map basically reconfigures the property ownerships into large 
bulk parcels that then fit with the specific plan planning areas. Major benefit of this now is also we get the, the road dedications for what we're calling Ridge Road, which is the collector road through the center, and then Airport Road. Once we have those roads dedicated, then it makes it much easier to develop these um, sub areas, which are now these bulk lots that are created. As I mentioned, the small lot maps come back through for a future approval by Planning Commission. Development agreement, um, we've literally, I think, met over 20 times to negotiate this. A number of changes were worked out based on the Planning Commission's um, recommendations. So the development agreement is included in Ordinance B. It's been signed as of today by all the major property owners. Um, the key deal points would be this, this is a 20-year agreement. This is a contract between the cities and the developers guarantees the construction of the community park with two soccer fields, two baseball fields, playground and a restroom. Park has to start construction by the 250th unit, has to be done within one year. Developers responsible for funding land acquisition and construction in the neighborhood of $4.8 million. City is going to contribute up to $400,000 in city park impact fees to make that happen. There's requirements for affordable housing. There'll be 100 apartment units. Um, those can either be 53 low income units for 55 years, or they could include 33 low income, 33 moderate income, and 33 market rate or 34 market rate units for a period of 30 years. So that's an option A, B um, that the developer can choose. There'll also be 96 workforce units. Those aren't deed restricted, um, but they will be designed by, uh, by design to be affordable for workforce um, families. And then there's a requirement for 53 accessory dwelling units to be built along with the single family units. There's a local preference program um, that um, provides advertising and preference to local buyers and contractors to be part of the project. There will be a requirement to join the city's community services f facility district um, that guarantees the revenue neutrality of the project. In terms of construction financing, there's also a community facilities district for infrastructure bonds that's covered by this development agreement. And then there's a requirement for a homeowners association and maintenance responsibilities by the project. As I mentioned, we did prepare a fiscal impact report for the project. Um, that shows that the project is revenue neutral, which is a general plan requirement for this kind of a project. The, so the community services um, facility district um, will be required um, to be formed and annexed into before any development. That will then require that any new single family units pay an 850 annual fee to offset their cost of services. Multifamily units will pay an $81 fee. Any deed restricted affordable units would be exempt, which is the city's current policy. Local streets and landscaping throughout the project will be the responsibility of the Homeowners Association for maintenance. Okay, environmental impact report. So because of the scale of this project, we did prepare an environmental impact report. It's been circulated for public review for 45 days. That ended on April 24th. We received 19 comments um, from the public as well as public agencies. Primary issues identified were ag impacts, oak tree removals, traffic, and then air quality impacts, including greenhouse gases. Less than significant impacts were water, sewer, and public services. So air quality, one of the big issues was the potential for valley fever um, associated with disturbance of the earth. Um, there's a series of mitigation measures that are included to make sure that that um, impact is as minimal as possible, including training, neighborhood notification, um, and strict um, adherence to dust control measures. Oak tree impacts, there's 100 oak trees on the site. 82 are preserved, which is 82%. 18 will be removed. We walked the site very closely with the project engineers and arborists to identify um, which trees needed to be saved. All the high priority trees have been saved. Um, so they, they've done a really good job with the grading to maximize tree protection with this project. Then water supply is obviously a big issue for the community. Um, as you recall, Dick McKinley's given this presentation a number of times. This is the 19, or the 2015 
2016 Urban Water Management Plan. This is a state requirement that we provide an analysis of our water supply, not only today, but through build out of the city. So today, 2020, we use about 7,000 acre feet per year. When we hit build out, which this project was already calculated in the build out, um, we'll be at 9,500 acre feet per year. So we need another 2,500 acre feet, not only to build this project, but all the other projects on the general plan. The good news is even at that level, we'll still have a surplus of 7,700 acre feet because we have a series of different um, supplies, including basin wells, river wells, uh, the Nacimento um, water um, pipeline, and um, basically um, recycled water. Between those four supplies, we end up with a total supply of 17,000 acre feet. So we're very confident that um, we do have the adequate water supplies to serve not only this project, but all the other projects anticipated in the general plan. And with that, I'll turn over to the city engineer, Dave Athey, to walk us through the traffic section. Thank you, Mr. Frace. David Athey, City Engineer. I want to give you a real quick overview uh, of where we start with traffic, uh, citywide traffic planning, and then bring you right down into uh, project mitigations and impacts uh, so we can talk about that and inform you tonight. So first of all, the general plan uh, guides our traffic circulation, and the circulation element is one of eight sections in the general plan uh, that uh, gives us our blueprint for future um, transportation planning. Uh, this uh, blueprint was updated in 2018, and it looks at uh, traffic level forecasts out till about 2045, uh, our uh, city planning horizon. Uh, it identifies roads, intersections, and bridges uh, as you see on the exhibit B there on the right of the screen. And it also guides us in our traffic impact studies. Uh, that's what we did uh, for this project. Uh, we had Central Coast Transportation Consulting uh, look at the uh, existing traffic conditions in the area, uh, really over the entire city. Uh, it analyzes uh, project-specific impacts, uh, for instance, on Niblick Road, South River Road, um, and those types of areas around the site, and also provides uh, recommendations for mitigation and the timing of those mitigations for the project, which is uh, consistent with CEQA uh, nexus requirements. Uh, traffic counts. Uh, so first of all, for our traffic impact study, we start with a memo of assumptions. This basically lays out uh, everything we're going to look at, all the data for the project. So we start with traffic counts, as you can see here on the screen. We have uh, existing traffic volumes at various locations in the city. Next slide. Uh, and here is a, a blow up of segments. Uh, we have both an intersection, say number 11 here. This is the graphic at this point. We have traffic turning movements through the intersection. And we also have total volume through segments of road. So as you see here on the screen, we had about 20,000 cars go past this point. Uh, uh, when we did the traffic counts. So we looked at 24 intersections throughout the city, uh, 12 road segments, and we also looked at freeway segments, including Highway 46 East. Uh, the next thing we do is we look at project trip generation. Next slide. So this lays out uh, both the 674 unit, if there was no excess units allocated to the site, and we also looked at the traffic generation from a 911 unit project. As you can see here in this box, the net new trips, that's in and out, all the trips generated by the site uh, is around 10,500. Uh, the AM, we also look at the AM and PM peaks. Uh, as folks probably know when they drive around town, traffic gets congested on Crescent and Niblick and various roads. Uh, those are your peak hours. We also look at those um, numbers there. Next slide. We also look at traffic assignment and trip destinations. So around the city, we can look at our, we can model this based on uh, existing data. We know what people do now. Uh, that doesn't change much over time. Uh, and so we've assigned that uh, trip distribution throughout the city and that figure on the right here uh, shows that distribution. Uh, what's important is that this project uh, 
you know, sends traffic to both Caltrans and County of San Luis Obispo facilities. We worked very close with both agencies, and the memo of assumptions was accepted by both of those uh, agencies, uh, in, and they were in agreement with them. Next slide. So the next thing that our traffic impact report does is does an, eva is an evaluation of these impacts around the city. And we look at three successive time frames. We look at, we look at existing, what's happening today. We look at the near term, five years out, five to eight years out, and we look at the cumulative, uh, eight to 15 years out. And that takes into effect um, other projects. Uh, for example, the Ol Olson South Chandler Ranch project uh, and other approved and pending projects throughout town. So in those three successive time frames, we judge traffic based on what's being uh, generated, what's approved, uh, and what's existing, and what's proposed. Uh, it also uh, identifies the impact mitigation and timing. So um, we need to know at certain time periods when different improvements need to need to be built uh, and the traffic impact study allows us to do that and which those timings for the mitigations are used in the EIR for the uh, for the requirements of the EIR next slide so this slide right here shows you a um, a map of the city with different intersections for instance this is the Creston Road 13th Street Bridge in this location um, in this location the project is required to do right turn overlaps and adaptive signal timing. Uh, this is the Niblick Road corridor. The project is uh, required to do turn lanes, adaptive signal timing, and fair share payments uh, for different uh, intersections here. So the plan really lays this out on a global scale so we can see exactly what uh, the impacts are and what the, uh, the solutions are for these impacts. Next slide. Oh, and, I, and, and we also have fair share payments for the interse intersection or interchange in SR46 and Union Road, and Golden Hill Roundabout. Uh, also, the, the project is going to be installing new signals uh, with adaptive signal timing, which I'll talk about shortly. Next slide. Oh, can we go back there, Warren? Just wanted to mention one thing. So we have had a, uh, some concern from the residents in the Spanish Camp area about Barley Grain Road and the potential for sending uh, a lot of traffic uh, down this direction. Uh, in response, uh, the applicant and the city have worked uh, together to find solution to this uh, concern and have agreed upon uh, centerline striping down Barley Grain uh, so that we can make sure that the, the road is separated and uh, does not present itself as a hazard. Next slide. So I want to just talk about the offsite traffic mitigations. Um, as I mentioned before, we look at different time frames. Uh, and in this case, uh, this is prior to the first house final. There are several improvements that need to occur. Uh, very importantly, here on Creston Road, we have three signals. We get a lot of complaints about these signals. And the traffic sends uh, some of it, some of its um, some traffic ends up here from the project. Uh, it is not a large amount of, pro of traffic, but it is enough to uh, cause an impact at this location. So we have uh, right turn overlap phases, uh, signal timing and new right turn lane striping at these three locations. Uh, with uh, what's important is this, uh, this new signal timing, adaptive signal timing really uh, allows the city to operate the signal looking at traffic in real time. In the past, you used to update signal timing maybe every two, three, or four years uh, in response to changing traffic. Well, with adaptive signal timing, you can change traffic to respond to differing conditions almost instantaneously. So the signals are always talking to each other, um, in this case, uh, in this area, and they'll look at the traffic loading and they'll look at the traffic loading on the different uh, sections of the different legs of the intersection and adapt to that and change the signal timing to let more cars go through, uh, give more green time to legs that have um, you know, a heavier traffic volume. Also, uh, at Niblick and South River Road, there's a requirement to install a right turn lane. 
uh, again, right turn overlap phase and signal timing upgrades to improve uh, traffic flow at that location. Next slide. Now, prior to the 250th building permit, the project uh, applicant is required to uh, conduct an intersection study. And really that study is to figure out prior to the 554th unit, when will this roundabout need to be installed? So the mitigation is a roundabout at this location as shown here on the uh, bottom right of your screen. Uh, and that, that study will tell us um, when this needs to go in based on traffic conditions at the 250th unit. And it may and it will not be installed any later than the 554th unit. Now, prior to the 500th unit, we're looking at Creston and Nibbic Road. That's this center section right here. This um, here uh, includes a number of improvements, including installing right turn lanes, uh, installing a second left turn lane on the uh, southbound leg, and a signal upgrades. Again, that adaptive signal timing really making this intersection work. Uh, and they'll be doing this work if it's not constructed by the Olson South Chandler Ranch. Next slide. Now, prior to the 554th unit, there are signal upgrades at both Meadowlark and Stony Brook Road. Uh, this is uh, Stony Brook down here, Stony Creek on the, the bottom. Uh, it includes uh, new signal and new striping and new corner ramps. And then up at Metal Arc, it'll also be a signal and uh, improved striping and uh, crossings there. And back one slide, please. And I just wanted to mention prior to the 911th unit, uh, prior to the end of the project, uh, we're gonna look at the Charlotte and Creston Road intersection just, just to the south of, of Metal Arc and uh, install a stop sign at that location. Now I want to talk about uh, project circulation on site. So as Mr. Frace mentioned, there is an arterial. This is Airport Road. They will be installing that as part of the project. It also includes neighborhood streets, which I'll show you a picture of. It includes traffic calming. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, which are these two circles here, which include many roundabouts. Now we get a lot of complaints about speeding on Meadowlark Road from area residents. And uh, this condition here with these too many roundabouts, your typical design speed is 15 to 20 miles an hour for cars going through there. Uh, this will aid in slowing cars down in this corridor, and there will be a stop control intersection at airport and metal arc. Uh, also includes parking improvements along Beechwood Drive, uh, including parking improvements on Ridge Road uh, to serve both the park uh, and will also be able to serve the nearby school um, just across the street. We'll also include student drop-off on Meadowlark Road here. And uh, this will, uh, the new striping and student drop-off will increase the uh, usability of this area for the school and, and, improve, and improve traffic. As Mr. Frace also mentioned, it also includes trails and paths that go through the site. So there'll be lots of amenities for the residents uh, to uh, get out and walk and get exercise. Next slide. So here's Airport Road. Uh, we have 11 foot lanes with a six foot bike lane and also includes multi-use path on one side and a sidewalk on the other. This is consistent with the um, other sections of Airport Road. Next slide. Yeah, this is a picture of Ridge Road, includes bike lanes and travel lanes. Again, we have the multi-use path on Meadowlark Road and also 10-foot travel lanes and 6-foot bike lanes. And that section there is carried from the project boundary all the way down to Olson South Chandler Ranch. Uh, this is uh, Creston Road. Creston Road will be widened. We'll have a center left turn lane and two 11-foot travel lanes and a multi-use path um, for that city, uh, that city uh, circular path that Mr. Frace mentioned. Beechwood Drive, uh, from the school, we have diagonal and parallel parking. Though, like I mentioned before, we'll have diagonal parking down near the school and the park, and uh, parallel parking near the existing neighborhood to the west, uh, and no parking on the uh, project side and a multi-use path. 
neighborhood roads, uh, very consistent with city engineering standards, uh, seven foot parking lanes, 10 foot travel lanes uh, for these very low volume, low use roads in the neighborhoods. Uh, we also have a neighborhood road with enhanced sidewalks, uh, eight foot sidewalks so that uh, folks can uh, use that for recreation and that goes through the middle of the site. Next, uh, next slide. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Frace for the remainder of the presentation. Yeah, so we're almost done here. Thanks, Dave. Um, so Dave talked a lot about uh, the traffic mitigations, those are all wrapped up in what we call the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. This is the summary of all the mitigation measures that are identified in the EIR. So this is part of your resolution A that the city council would take action on as part of the EIR process, but this would lock in that all these mitigation measures would happen. Um, we do have some what we call class one impacts, even though those are considered un mitigatable, there's still mitigation measures that you have to um, take into account and those are included as well. As I mentioned, we received 19 comments, 14 from public agencies, or 14 from the public, excuse me, five from public agencies. The response to all of those comments are included um, in the final EIR, which is also part of resolution A. Um, because this is an EIR with class one impacts, we do have to make um, findings and statements of overriding considerations. Those class one impacts are air quality and transportation. The statement of overriding considerations um, factors in the social and economic benefits of the project, including the variety of housing provided, um, the provision of open space and recreation, the oak tree protection and replanting program, the bike and trail system that will be provided, the benefit of jobs and economic development from the project, as well as the additional public facilities. So those are all justifications included in your findings to justify approval of the project and certification of the EIR. So in terms of your options, there's six options for council consideration. This is a legislative act tonight, so you do always have the option to take no action. Option two is to approve the project as recommended by Planning Commission with 911 units. Option three would be approve the project with minor changes. Option three, um, this is an EIR alternative, which is the environmentally superior alternative, which would be to approve a project with 250 units. This isn't recommended in that we already have zoned the property for 674 units um, so that we would create some legal issues by down zoning to 250. Um, the city attorney could go into that in detail if there's any questions about that. Uh, the fifth option would just be to deny the specific plan. Um, in that case, the project would still remain with a zoning of 674 units and the ability to build 47,000 square feet of commercial. And the sixth option would be to refer it back to the Planning Commission and staff for additional analysis. Planning Commission and staff are recommending option two, which is to approve the project with 911 units. To take that action, um, there's seven actions to consider. Um, first would be um, to approve Resolution A, that would certify the EIR. Second would be to approve Resolution B, which would approve the general plan amendments. Third would be to introduce for first reading by title only Ordinance A, which is the zoning code amendments. Fourth, Resolution C, which is the specific plan approval. Number five would be Resolution D, which is the oak tree removal permit. Number six would be Resolution E, which would be approval of the large lot vesting tentative track map. And then finally, Action 7 would be introduced for first reading by title only Ordinance B, which is the development agreement between the city and the property owners. So that concludes staff's report. Um, as I mentioned, we do have the applicant's team available here for questions, and that will move us on to council questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of information, a lot of work obviously gone into this. Um, we will handle this as we always do, first with council questions of staff and of the applicant. Uh, this is a time for us to clarify information before we go to public comment. We take the public's input. When that's complete, we bring it back to the council for council discussion and decision. So let's start off with uh, council questions. Mr. Gregory. Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Martin. <clears throat> so Warren, I just had a, um, 
Can you quickly summarize the changes requested by Planning Commission? Yeah, so I think the, the main things that the Planning Commission recommended was that we accelerate the timing of the park. It was originally going to be at the 500th unit. Now on the development agreement um, would be a requirement that it start construction at the 250th unit. They wanted to update and enhance the design guidelines. Um, that has been included as well. So those were the two major recommendations that came out of the Planning Commission process. Very good. So then I had a couple of quick questions. So I saw that you have the ADU allocation. So how do you spread that out amongst the units in the project? Yeah, so there's a requirement that about 56 odd um, ADUs be constructed um, throughout the project. So as each phase of development comes through, um, we'll work with the applicant on tracking to make sure that we're continuing to make progress um, toward that 56 units. Um, there isn't a magic number for each subphase in terms of how many are built, um, but there is a process through the development agreement where we'll track that. And then um, at what point in the project um, on Meadow Arc are they proposing to put in the roundabouts? Dave, do you want to hit that one? Certainly. Um, these are the mini roundabouts I, I suppose you're referring to, Mr. Gregory. The, um, those will be installed with the development of each of the different uh, phases. So as development is moving down Meadow Arc Road, say if it started in the corner there at Meadow Arc and Beechwood, um, as, as, as the development marches to the east, uh, they would have to build those frontage improvements with those with those approved uh, small lot grading or small lot maps that come through. So those two roundabouts would be between Beechwood and airport? Somewhere. Yes, yes. And the only other question I had is on, I had a couple uh, grading questions, but I've seen that quite a bit of the grading has changed. I wanted to know the, uh, the grading heights of off of Meadowlark Road on the far east, east side of the project, but it's changed pretty dramatically. So I don't know if I can see it on the maps, but you have to put it on the for us. So where exactly did you want to know the heights, Councilman? Well, it looks like on uh, by Airport Road and Meadow Arc, um, before there was, it was much steeper near Meadowwood, but it looks like that's been changed. So the gradient going up Meadow Arc southward uh, east of Airport Road, so it looks like it's under five foot grades going for the first couple hundred feet. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think that's that cross section um, C, which is, oh, I can't have both the pointer and the zoom, goodness. Yeah, so it's section CC. Um, so there's some six foot walls higher up the slope, and then there is a, s a slope bank um, against Meadowlark. I believe that's kind of in the 10 foot range, um, kind of looking at the um, exhibit there. So would that be right on Meadowlark or set, set back from Meadowlark? Yeah, Meadowlark Road includes a landscape setback already. So past the landscape setback on the road, then there would be a landscape slope. So it really has the effect of just setting the houses back even further from Meadowlark Road. So if I have, I'll let the other comments come in, then I'll, I'll ask more questions later. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Yes, thank you. Okay, I have a number of questions, and, and I'm, I want to pick up from where Councilman Gregory wrapped off on that area over there, which is Area F, I believe. And in Area F, that's for those the two hills currently exist, one that's a little over 900 foot elevation and the other one that's uh, about 800 foot elevation. And if those are, how, how far are those coming, being brought down? Because that, the map was rather confusing to me. I saw, I saw the one with the brown, and the one with the brown looked like there was hardly any anything being done there, any grading. But then this one that you're showing right there 
shows rather extensive gradient on those two hills. And is that cumulative? Is that yellow what it all winds up as when you're done? Yeah, so if we look at this grading heat map that's on the screen, um, green areas would be zero to five feet of cut. Yellow would be five to 10 feet of cut. Orange is 10 to 15 feet of cut. And red, which would be the maximum anywhere on the site, would be between 15 and 20 feet of cut. So I think this area you're referring to, you can see there's a little bit of red right there um, where there's a high point on the site. And therefore, the, the, we're going to pretty well flatten that whole thing out, I guess. Is that correct? Yes, it will be flatter than it currently is. but. If you look at the existing slope map, you know, this feature right here yes. Yes. is actually already under 5%. So although it's high um, and we are going to reduce its height, it's not currently a steep area. It's fairly flat already. Now, yeah, that's, that's what I assumed. But, it's, but it is high. And this will bring its elevation down significantly, correct? It'll reduce it um, 20 feet at the, at the most. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then, uh, actually, I, I was looking at. I'm, I'm going to stay on that topic because uh, is is our geology people here? Because we had a geology report from uh, Mid Coast Geotechnical, and they had a soil test site B5 in that general area, and I was wondering if that site was in the San Ysidro Arbuckle soils. Hello? Nice yes, yeah, so hang on one second, Councilman Strong. We'll see if um, the applicant has, do you have any of your civil engineers available to answer that? Yes. Tom Martin, um, are you available to address that? Hi, Warren. Um, we do have the geotechnical report, but um, the geotechnical engineer, I don't believe, is on the call. And I don't know that specific question about those soil profiles. I'll try to look it up while we're um, reviewing questions, if I can, and try to get back to you. Otherwise, we'll follow up. Okay, yeah, because the, the big question there is if it's a San Ysidro Arbuckle soil, the uh, whichever is dominant, either the San Ysidro or the Arbuckle, makes a significant difference in the integrity of, of, of that uh, that area for building purposes. So put it in my ear. Where did the little key box go? Uh, desk. So, Mr. Martin, you want to take some time and kind of get back to us on an answer to that? Sure, I will give that a shot while we're um, on the meeting. So we'll come back with an answer on that, Councilman Strong. Okay, thank you. And then on the traffic counts, I'm just noticing that in our general plan from 2003, we were projecting traffic counts uh, throughout the city for the year 2025. And, uh, you know, we're getting close to that now. But uh, it was interesting, I thought, that when we were looking at uh, Creston Road, somewhere in the vicinity of between uh, Meadowlark and, and Niblick, that we're only at about two-thirds of what was projected. On the other hand, if we look at Niblick itself, uh, down farther, farther lower, we're at almost double what was projected. So I'm wondering, have we analyzed that at all? Maybe, maybe Dave Atty has a. I guess that's one of the reasons we're going to do a major major redo on Niblick right now. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Strong. The traffic changes over time, um, and we we do our best to model that based on you know current circulation, current traffic volumes. Uh, you know the big the big things that happened between that have happened between 2003 and today are the the Great Recession, uh, and that has had a uh, an impact on building, as Mr. Frace 
had mentioned. Uh, so, you know, when we do when we do the estimates uh, for the circulation element in the 20, 2003 general plan, we're assuming a growth rate that's going to occur over time. And if that doesn't happen, and that can change, um, that can change traffic. Uh, traffic volumes can also change based on new development that goes in, say, commercial or develop our commercial development that goes out. Um, so that's why we update our circulation element about every five years, uh, so we can get a, an, an ever continuing snapshot of what's going on and, and continue to plan and continue to prepare ourselves for traffic and how that's turning out uh, and going to turn out in the future. Okay, well, I have a question in that area too, because all of a sudden, none of this obviously anticipated any kind of a pandemic. And the pandemic is changing our working patterns rather dramatically which are pro is probably going to have an impact on how our traffic patterns change. So I'm wondering if uh, we're anticipating any special type of studies in, in that regard to, to get a better handle on, on what our projections are and should be, because a lot of our, our traffic impacts, even from this uh, EIR, might be drastically off, considering a, a totally unanticipated aspect of, of, of our current society. Right. So, you know, anecdotally, we don't have actual traffic counts around the city right before COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. But in talking with the police department, um, you know, it appeared right at the beginning of the shutdown that we were down about 15 to 20 percent of existing vo of typical volumes uh, that has picked back up now. I anticipate that if telecommuting and Zoom meetings and those kind of things uh, continue to be a big part of society moving into the future post post COVID post vaccine. Um, you know, that would have a beneficial effect for the city because less people would be on the road, more people would be working from home, there'd be less trips. Uh, so from a traffic engineering standpoint, we like to take a conservative approach uh, and look at and look at um, <clears throat> you know what what we anticipate the growth is going to be and we'll continue to update that as we go along we we believe we have a pretty good handle on the traffic just prior to the um to the government lockdown and we think that this is still a prudent course of action even with the covid uh slowdown in traffic volumes because it, okay, ha it has started to rebound thank you and then i have I have more of planning and a community development question. And that is, uh, all the USGS maps show a blue line stream on this site. And how are we handling that blue line stream in this plan? Yes, um, we've done a very thorough analysis of um, <laughs> the impacts to wetlands. And I think maybe I'll turn it over to Dan Lloyd. Um, he can kind of walk us through, but yeah, the Blue Line Creeks um, were part of the analysis. Okay, Thank good. You for the question, Dan Lloyd. Uh, Thanks, hang, hang on, Dan. Oh, I'm gonna turn that mic on. Councilman Strong, thank you for the question. This is Dan Lloyd. Sure. One, on. of the, one of the, do we have, uh, we have volume? Can you hear me, Fred? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. All right. Um, one of the major resources on the site was or is the wetland resources. The Blue Line Stream is there because there's very gentle swale that runs through the, the site. There are a number of uh, wetland areas that we're dealing with, but I can say what our goal has been is to work with the resource move it where we needed to in order to accommodate a, a reasonable development layout, and then enhance that area through expansion. There is, you know, if you have an impact, you have a mitigation ratio of two or three to one. I think we're dealing with three to one. So what we're going to end up with is taking these marginal wetlands, and they are marginal, and enhancing them, relocating them, and integrating them into the streetscape as well as the, the natural environment. So we're working right now with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Regional Water Quality Control Board to secure permits that will allow us to expand the wetland areas, improve them, 
and mitigate the, the impacts to those facilities. So good question, and we're on it. Okay, and then my question is immediately uh, adjacent to them or, or downhill from them. Uh, is our grading such that we'll still have some kind of a, a raised area that provides a buffer so that if we have a really unusual situation and a lot of water coming down there, that we're not going to flood some other area? I think the, the easiest thing to say to you is that there is virtually very little water that is on the site. I will tell you that the Blue Line stream is now fed by what we believe to be a leaky irrigation line from the uh, <laughs> existing vineyard. And it, 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 one of the issues that we're really struggling with is to get water to that facility uh, during what you call normal rainfall years so that it does hydrate those, those soils. Uh, but it, it's been a little bit perplexing for us, but we don't have anywhere near the type of, of, of flooding potential that we have. But please be aware of this. We also have detention basins that are, are positioned adjacent to these facilities so that we capture the runoff, we cleanse it, and then we put it into the wetland area. So it's, it's a very integrated process for cleaning the water, filling it into the wetland areas, and thereby maintaining it going into the future. Okay, this currently isn't uh, it the ridge line that is right just westerly of Blue Line Stream? The ridge line, do you mean like Ridge Road or the, the, the high point in the well, site? Like the current ridge that runs through there, it's a hill, oh, well, a hill, but it, yeah. it, it's, it forms a real long ridge. Yeah, it's and the east west ridge road is it, it basically there's a separation of a fairly clean separation between the north side of the site and the south side of the site. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Garcia. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my questions were more about the traffic uh, as far as the school. Um, I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I didn't see any um, anything um, as far as you're talking about the drop off for the students and things like that. Do you have more information for us? Do you have a map? What it's going to look like? Presentation. Uh, I just. Hi, Councilwoman. Uh, David Athey, City Engineer. So as we see on the screen there, the uh -huh. um, that's where the, the diagonal parking will be uh, in that area. And then down at the corner of Ridge Road and Beachwood Drive, there will be bulb outs, and so which will create a shortened crossing path across Beachwood Drive for students coming out of the development and walking towards school. And then on um, Meadowlark Drive, We'll have uh, formalized pickup and drop off areas. And then they're also going to restripe Meadow Arc Road from Beachwood to Creston Road with class two bike lanes and uh, parking zones. So that will provide a uh, route to school for kids that want to ride their bike. Um, and the, the basically the frontage of the school will turn into drop off and pick up uh, area and in order to create a um, circulation pattern and also school buses will be um, able to pick up and drop off along the frontage of Beachwood Drive for the school. We'll formalize that also. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, several questions touching on high points of the report here. And this is in response to the uh, concerns expressed to me by citizens in past Robles. And it's sort of an overarching question because this is obviously a significant project and will take a long time to build out. But we can see from the presentation tonight, we have gears within gears within gears. But I think the concerns most often expressed to me by citizens are how much, if any of this, will be subsidized by existing citizens. And we talk about, we talk about short-term, mid-term, and long-term traffic concerns road construction, striping, signalization, many roundabouts, et cetera. Uh, is this all at the developer's expense or is the city subsidizing any of this? 
Yes, Mr. Mayor. So um, we've done a number of different kind of fiscal analysis and modeling of the project to try to pin that down and make sure that we're consistent with the council policy um, requiring that revenue neutrality. So let me find that slide really quick. There it is. So in terms of just the overall impact on city services, that's what the fiscal impact report looked at. So that's impacts to police, fire, uh, public works, parks and rec, all that sort of thing. So that's where these fees, these annual fees of $815 for single family and $81 for multifamily, that's what those do is those offset those impacts to those existing city services so that the existing public, um, their level of service isn't impacted by this project. So that's that part. And then you brought up the um, issue of basically offside offsite road improvement. So we do have the uh, circulation element that uh, the city engineer spoke of and basically that identified future facilities that needed to be upgraded throughout the city. We have what's called a traffic impact fee that all new development pays into and that's basically assessed at a per unit um, cost. And what happens there is the projects that end up building the facilities like this project will get a credit back against their impact fees. And then other developments throughout town that don't build these facilities, they'll pay the fee. And basically this traffic impact account is basically a way to settle that up between all the projects as they build out over the next 30 or 40 years. Now, the good news is that the general public, um, they don't have to pay for these new facilities. There's some some existing deficiencies that is the responsibility of the existing public and that's where the city typically uses grant funding and that sort of thing to make up I guess what we'd call the public share of any future expansion to projects um, that are needed for circulation benefit and then finally the impact to park and recreation facilities as we mentioned this project's actually building a community park that serves the uh, whole um, east side of town so they're actually providing a park that's well beyond what the demand of this um, of the needs of this project are. So they're going above and beyond in terms of park facilities. So I think it's very safe to tell the public that this project is doing more than its share to offset its impact, and it's clearly paying its fair share of costs um, for roads, parks, um, and overall infrastructure. And if I may just say, if I may just add to that, Mr. Mayor, um, the project is also responsible for maintaining its interior roads through a HOA, um, and uh, so that that will also not be a burden on existing uh, taxpayers in the city. Thank you. Obviously, we have a conversation right now about how thinly stretched our police and fire department are. Uh, this is obviously going to be a big assignment in the future. Will these fees be adequate to offset the additional protection that we'll have to pay for for that area? Yeah, that fiscal impact report was prepared by the city's consultant, David Tosik and Associates, and that's what they looked at specifically was police and fire build out. So this project will pay, pay its fair share. I think the issues we're talking about right now in terms of um, funding facilities is the existing deficiency, which is the existing public share. But these new projects will more than pay for their share of those, those services. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we've had the opportunity for council to ask questions. Now we're going to go to the public for their questions and comments. Once Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, John Hammond did. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. That's yeah, okay. I'm always. Uh, I've got a bunch, but uh, why don't we get into public comment and then we can come back. I can, I can wait. Well, I, 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 that was a terrible faux pas on my part. Go ahead with your questions, John. Well, there's a bunch, but... Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll take a stab here. So, uh, starting off with again uh, for Warren, dwelling units remaining in the city. We uh, allotted um, bonus units to this project, uh, getting it up to 911. What exactly do we have left in our city uh, with regard to um, units remaining? Okay, so that is the question of the surplus density units. So in 2013, the city council adopted a resolution that identified 594 uh, surplus density units. 
Um, as of 2018, um, all those 594 units have been allocated to projects by the city council, which includes the 237 for the Beachwood specific plan. So that means right now there aren't any remaining units to be reallocated to future projects and there aren't any requests right now. Now, you'll remember this summer, um, we were reviewing the housing element and the housing element update includes a policy to account for fractional or small multifamily units. And based on adopting that policy, which will be in front of the council in December, that has the potential to create an additional 300 surplus density units. So although right now, potentially we're at zero surplus units, potentially if the council adopts the housing housing element as proposed, you will now have a fresh uh, 300 units to start reallocating starting next year. Are those complete uh, or are those just uh, ADUs? In other words, auxiliary dwelling unit? No, there'll be full units um, that can be built out um, in new development projects. Okay. All right. So that helps a little bit on this. Um, the development agreement, 20 years. So if they... <laughs> We're, we're going to grant, um, hopefully tonight, um, this project, which gives them entitlements. Um, if they do not exercise the entitlements within 20 years, do they lose them? Or how does that work? <laughs> So there's different layers to it. There, there's zoning entitlements, specific plan entitlements. Those sorts of things don't go away. Those, those stay in place. The large lot tentative map, all those are, are, are permanent. Um, there's some additional terms in addition to that that are included in the development agreement that potentially would go away if the project didn't get completed. I think the attorney, Matt Summers, could probably fill in some details if you want some more kind of speculation on that well the the point is is to get development happening and to get more housing units available to our public and, and inside our city and and again once we grant these kind of entitlements um basically we've improved their um equity you might say in the whole project but um on the other hand it doesn't necessarily mean that we get housing units inside the city either so that's why I was kind of thinking again, if we have some sort of a um, time frame that you know agreement phasing units that we can uh, count on, that's what I'm hoping to see. Or you know, do, do we have any kind of language in there regarding that? Yeah, so I think we're going to have the applicant's attorney Andrew Fogg um, address that. So he's coming to the mic right now. This is Andrew Fogg. And Warren, while he's coming to the mic, I'm available as well. Thank you, Matt. Matt. If, if Matt would like to do it. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Andrew. Good evening, uh, council members and honorable mayor. Um, section 3.1.2 of the development agreement uh, does require uh, certain phasing uh, in that uh, there has to be a grading permit commencement of grading of phase one within five years, and then there's uh, uh, it flows out to the other phases from there. So there is a provision in there that requires the um, uh, commencement of construction and work on the project within a specific time frame. And then if those time frames aren't met, uh, that can that creates what can be uh, determined by the city to be a material breach of the development agreement that then triggers certain rights and remedies of the city under the development agreement, including up to termination of the agreement. So there are some significant um, penalties uh, under the agreement if, if the work isn't undertaken. And of course, there are force majeure and other things that can come into play. So there is a schedule that uh, uh, does hold the developers to commence work on the project. Okay. Um, maybe a further question for the attorney then. Um, in the development agreement, uh, is there language in there regarding use of local contractors? In other words, uh, we've seen projects like this happen where uh, no locals were really used, but from the valley and that sort of thing. So do we have language in there? Regarding yes, council members. Uh, yes, council member Hammond, We have language the same as was in the Olson project that requires contracting opportunities to be provided first by the developer, and including any merchant builders that come in to local contracting opportunities. We aren't forcing that they only contract with locals, as that would implicate um, certain federal rights. But we are requiring that they provide first preference to locals. 
And if I could add one more point on the phasing point question, also in that section 3112, there's three, three triggers, five years to start phase 1A, 10 years to start phase 1B, and 17 years to start phase 2, with a further requirement that every two years the developers submit a report to the city manager as to their progress, even as they start now, so that we have an early opportunity to take a look at the site. And if it's being stalled for reasons that aren't uh, appropriate or that we wouldn't find is acceptable, there's an early opportunity to start conversations short of termination to move it forward. Thank you. That's that's exactly what I'd like to hear. Again, it, we're giving the public uh, assurances that the entitlements that we're granting the project will be exercised. And again, development happens, in other words. So that's that's what's important to me. Um, back to staff then maybe regarding the um, park maintenance cost. And, and um, it's four acres, I think, roughly. And, and um, the CFD, is that completely taking care of the maintenance? Or is there a portion of the CFD um, that is going to be taking care of the park along with the rest of the citizens in Pass Robles? So in terms of the maintenance, um, the local streets and the landscaping within the project area will be the maintenance requirements of the homeowners association. Um, the CFD won't be providing maintenance within the project area. The CFD, though, they will be paying their fees that will offset their share of the cost of the maintenance of the community park, which because this is a community park, this will be a city maintenance responsibility. Right, exactly. That's what I suspected. And um, there's a certain obviously percentage that Beach would be, uh, of course, paying into that as well. But do we have numbers? Do we know what this expense is going to run um, at all? So that's included in the fiscal impact report that is an exhibit to the um, development agreement in ordinance b um, there's lots of tables in there that basically get us to this calculation of 815 dollars per unit per year um, but that does include um, maintenance shares of parks and rec facilities throughout the community which this park will be part of that system so regarding revenue neutral to the rest of Roblins in town. The only thing that they can really uh, point to that would be the park maintenance that they indeed share when and also have use of. Um, would that be correct statement? Yeah, I think that's the only place where city crews are gonna be actively maintaining anything within this project area, with the exception of water and sewer, which is enterprise fund maintenance. And I saw the design with a couple ball fields, some other things. Is that uh, pinned down? Is that set in concrete at this point? What, how far along is that park design? Yeah, so that park design's been through a couple reviews by the Parks and Rec Commission or committee. Um, and they, uh, this was their recommendation that it include the two soccer fields, um, the two youth baseball fields, the playground and the restroom facility. Um, so this is a design that they've endorsed. Um, everybody understands that we still need to go through a public participation process. So once the pandemic um, restrictions are lifted, the next step is to do some outreach with the neighborhoods and make sure that we fine tune this design to work with the neighborhood um, concerns as well. And I'll start to shift then to the biggest problem I have with the project, and it's not really the project itself, it's more the design of the traffic lanes, which I'm gonna get into in a minute, but regarding the parking to the actual park or adjacent to the park, did I see that that was a diagonal back end type parking, David, Athy, or is that um, directional coming uh, from south to north on Beachwood? Yes, Councilman Hammond, that is correct. The Parking on uh, Beachwood would be back in type parking, and the idea is to, um, as as folks come to the park and unload uh, the, their materials, typically out of their SUV or other type of vehicle with a hatchback, um, they would not be carrying it out into the traffic. They would unload it onto the sidewalk and then uh, directly you know, take that material directly into uh, the park. Yeah, this is something new then for Pass Robles. Um, 
have we bounced that off many people or i mean is that just something that we want to try for the first time or or what's the thought on that no, I think you're correct. This is the first time that it would be uh, instituted in Pass Robles. Uh, Beachwood Avenue is a very low volume road. Uh, of course, the volume will pick up with the development. However, there is a school zone in this area of 25 miles an hour when children are present. It is also a park zone uh, with the same type of speed limit. So in terms of uh, folks pulling out in and out, uh, it actually presents an opportunity to increase safety a little bit. As I mentioned, folks won't be um, getting out of their truck and unloading stuff in the street, they'll unload it on the sidewalk. Uh, also, when cars pull out of back end diagonal parking, it is easier for them to see um, bicyclists in the street. We anticipate with the uh, school just down the road, um, this will be a benefit. There is a class, uh, a class two bike lane, the bike lane in the road uh, here that will be there on the um, outside of the diagonal parking. So it, it presents an also a safety opportunity at that point. Okay. Um, so I, I got to tell you again, the whole project's a long time in coming. I got to congratulate Dan Lloyd and Harrods and hers because everybody involved in the actual design of the uh, lots. However, uh, it's always been my pet peeve with regard to our city right away of streets. And again, this isn't really on them, it's on us. And, and if, you know, we get to uh, some of these designs inside uh, the, uh, the plan here, and I'm, I'm talking section views that are traffic lanes of 10 feet with um, six foot um, bike lanes next to them is not something I wanna see. Personally, again, I, this is me, and I'm I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to have a major problem voting for this project if we cannot change or adjust our right-of-way lines here. Um, I mean, we work within our right-of-way, but how we design this traffic lane, I think, is really, really important because, in my opinion, we need to address the use that is most prevalent, which would be a vehicle, and to make a 10-foot traffic lane down so tight um, that it gives you only 18 inches on either side of that uh, within your own lane. It's too tight, in my opinion, way too tight. We had thought that, again, we talked about previous, that we would not have anything less than 11 feet in our city. Um, but now we're seeing a whole development, mostly with 10 foot lanes. There are some others and there's a lot of them here, but if we have room to adjust these, then I can, I can, talk further about it but again if you go through all these section views in the uh, plan it's just way too tight in my opinion and, and again I don't know what the rest of the council is going to go for but uh, a, tr a bike lane is five feet essentially I see some sections here like on Ridge Road you've got two 10-foot traffic lanes with a five-foot bike lane on either side that to me is just and that's a major thoroughfare for this whole project it's too tight David I, I'm not sure where this all came from, uh, who had the input on this, uh, if it was regarding, you know, traffic calming. You've already got, you know, the lanes being uh, not straight, they're curvy. And whenever you turn a car, you know, you tend to go to the edge of a lane, which again, it gets too tight. And I'm worried about bicycles and everything else that might be in that lane along with it. So what can you uh, talk about to that as far as the traffic lanes specifically being 10 feet within this project? Uh, yes, thank you, Councilman Hammond. So we worked quite a bit with the developer um, and the applicants to really dial in the circulation system. We get a, the city gets a lot of complaints about speeding. Uh, Meadow Arc Road uh, is a prime example. Uh, and it's it's a fine balance. We're trying to create conditions that enhance neighborhoods uh, and keep speeding to a minimum. I think I, I get, I receive speeding complaints all over the city um, uh, from folks. It's really a citywide epidemic right now, uh, speeding is. And so we work with the applicants uh, to really take a hard look at keeping Keeping, tra keeping traffic speeds low um, while also complying with our engineering standards and minimizing 
the amount of asphalt that goes into this project because the every every linear foot of asphalt or square foot of asphalt adds to stormwater runoff and so we're trying to balance all these opposing um, I guess forces if you may uh, out there so we really tried to come up with middle grounds uh, some of the 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 arterials are at 11 feet uh, the six foot bike lane comes from our arterial standard that um, that that is where that comes from however you know if the council so desires and you'd like to change uh, lanes to 11 feet and with five foot bike lanes I think that's within your purview since this is a specific plan uh, in terms of moving right away I think uh, you know we've we've worked really hard to really dial it in for the for the for the developers so they know what they have left to build houses on and their lotting and um, and so forth so uh, really, it was a fine balance, and I think both the developer and the city are in agreement. And this is also consistent with the uh, Olson South Chandler specific plan and their street sections um, that were proposed and adopted by council there. So what is our current standard within the city? Uh, review that, please, David. So our, our local roads, thank you, our local road uh, standard is... Um, is 10 foot travel lanes with seven foot parking uh, where we have bike lanes it's seven foot parking with 10 foot and i'm talking about our engineering standards at this point uh seven foot parking with five foot uh, bike lanes and 10 foot travel lanes on local roads with uh, bike lanes and then it goes from there up so as we get to uh, arterials, uh, we've, as you know, we adopted the, the, the change standards of 11 and 12 foot preferred where there's room on different roads. Um, and so we still, we've, we've tried to implement that out there at the, uh, in this development and make that work for all the different roads here. Okay. Well, I'm not talking about adding more asphalt. Your, your, um, point to that means, that we just need to move a stripe, in my opinion. Um, I do like these um, roundabouts on Metal Arc. They're, I think, designed for, you said 15 miles per hour, but I think you clearly we can get a little higher uh, speed through them, and it does still slow the traffic. That is important, I think, and I think it's a good feature, but the internal uh, travel lanes inside the, the whole area is the major problem I have. And um, I like to hear what Bristol council is going to talk about on that. Um, I think that's all I had at this point. I'll, I'll reserve for further. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Uh, there was a question from council strong regarding soils. Did we get any information on that? Yeah, Dan Lloyd, I think, is going to respond. Yeah, let's let's, let's ask if Tom Martin found anything. I, I do have some information. Go ahead, Tom. Sure. So um, just in reviewing the SOAS report again, um, it's been a while, but um, I think the the issue is that uh, a soils map was looked at in the IR, and those are broad brush uh, maps, and what's probably – more accurate to look at is the soil borings and so there is a soil boring in the uh, eastern part of the site near the Hubner property and the soils are pretty consistent across the site with sandy clay and and clay sand and I, I believe the issue is whether there would be a potential for liquefaction or not um, and in the soils report it does have a section for liquefaction and it basically said that uh, it's the geotechnicals engineer's opinion that the likelihood of liquefaction is very low because there's uh, not the presence of groundwater and uh, the firm clay and sand in the soils. I hope that might answer the question. And Councilman Strong, this is Dan Lloyd again. I think what we have to keep our eye on is the fact that the entitlement process is going to require us to do a thorough review of the adequacy of soils uh, for the intended project. So we would be doing an expanded analysis of the individual projects in order to confirm that the soils are suitable for development. That doesn't mean that all soils are great. Some may require additional um, 
material to be placed in a fill area in order to make it stable. But at this point, the, uh, the geologist has determined that the site is suitable and that the risks are low. There may be specific recommendations that would come forward during the tentative map review process. So I think there's safeguards okay, Mr. ahead. Now, Mr. Mayor, can I follow up on that? Yeah, please do. Okay. My concern is the fact that it is very general, and I wasn't looking at liquefaction in this particular case. I was looking at the fact that we have approximately six different soils in that site. They're not all exactly the same. Yes, they're all clay and they're all a bit sandy, but they're, they have different characteristics. And they have very different strength characteristics as to how much of a load they can carry, according to the USGS and the Department of Agriculture reports on soils. And in that case, I was very concerned at, as to what exact type of soil was in that particular boring over there at B5. And even in your report, when we get to the B5 drilling or boring thing, it doesn't even tell us what soil type it is. It gives us some general things about the liquid limit, the plastic limit, the plasticity index, but it doesn't tell tell me uh, is this uh, uh, San Ysidro? Is it uh, uh, what what is it? What what did you test there? And that makes a big difference because some of these can carry uh, tr traffic and roads very well. Others are very poor, and they could be subject to actually just uh, uh, sinking in it, uh, or, or very high maintenance costs on those roads that I have to be concerned about in, in guarding the public interest. So I would be very much interested in that before uh, we move too far ahead, especially the fact that you already know you have to bring in 20 cubic, 20,000 cubic yards of non-native soil because of the poor quality of the native soil and being able to carry these loads. And if you bring in 20,000 cubic yards of foreign soil, uh, then perhaps you don't have to remove as much native soil unless you're going to export another 20,000 cubic yards. So uh, I think uh, those questions should somehow be addressed before we get too far along in this project. If I may, uh, Councilman Strong and Mayor Martin. Please go ahead. The, the and, and I really appreciate your comments, Fred. It, it's, it's important. One of the things that you do in a soils analysis or when you're particularly talking about uh, designing a subdivision is you're looking for what's called the R value. And the R value is, is calculated based on the type of soils and that determines how far down you might have to over X and rebuild up. Again, looking to the EIR in section four, I believe it, it didn't identify that there were any specific problems with this particular soil. And you're, you're right, when you have an amalgamation of soil types, you're gonna have different characteristics. And a lot of that sometimes requires blending of materials. You end up moving material around the site rather than necessarily taking it off site and bringing in particular fill material. However, to assure you, there will be site-specific soils analysis for each one of the projects that are envisioned uh, in the specific plan. The generalized environmental, generalized soil report that was prepared is just general in nature, but it did not identify that there are any fatal flaws. But your point's well taken. The work will be done. Uh, I don't believe we have a, a deal breaker here. It would just simply be more specific tests when the tentative map is processed so that we're all assured, and particularly the developer, that what is being done is going to be stable and appropriate for the use. Okay, thank you very much. My, my other comments would be comments and not questions, so I'll hold those until the end. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to public comment. We have several people who have been waiting patiently in queue. So we'll go to our first caller, who is uh, obviously first in line. So our first caller is Dale Gustin. Dale, are you with us? Mr. Gustin? Can we check to see if he's online? 
Mayor Martin, he has been put live into the meeting. He's not responsive, yeah. responding. Okay, maybe we can circle back to him later. Okay, shall we move to the next caller then? Uh, Mr. Ed Hale, are you with us, sir? Just a moment, Mayor Martin. Mm -hmm. Mayor, the call in the studio got muted. We're in the process of unmuting it. That's why Gail, Dale could not speak. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna hang tight then, and if we can get that unmuted, we'll go back to him first. That's gonna be for all the callers. Uh, so hang on just a minute. Probably have it done in 15 seconds. Can you hear me in the room? Yes. Great. We can hear you. you should be able to push Dale Justin live now. Am I on? Hi, Dale. Just a reminder to folks who just tuned in after a prolonged period of dead air. This is the Pasteurville City Council. We have just begun our public comment section on the Beachwood specific plan. Dale Gustin, you're our first caller. Welcome. Uh, Dale Gustin, 945 Spring Street. I have three areas of concern. And uh, the first one, the most important, is uh, the city circulation and how this uh, is impacting the master plan and how our master plan is inadequate. In 1979, when I came here, we had a population less than 8,000 or thereabouts. And we uh, saw in the 80s and 90s that we were headed towards a population of 25,000. Well, now we're double that. But even then, we master planned Airport Road to come down and connect over uh, to uh, 46 West and be a, a four-lane highway all the way uh, and uh, eliminate all the problems we're having now. Then, because they abandoned that, we tried to do something with Charlet Road and made it an arterial and thinking it might connect to 101, but we didn't even reach an agreement with the county to where we could make uh, Charlet a four-lane road. 
So now we're trying to do something through Crescent Road. And we got four lanes, two lanes, four lanes, two lanes. I mean, what a mess. Charlotte, uh, uh, Crescent Road uh, should be a four-lane arterial all the way between Charlotte and River Road and the freeway. And we would eliminate some of these uh, backups and, and especially in front of the schools and that. Then moving on to the other problem uh, we have is our inadequacy of addressing low-income housing. Low-income housing is uh, inadequately addressed in our housing problem uh, situation. We are, if you take the, minimum, the average wage of an employee in Paso Robles, it's pretty low. And there's no way that what uh, you're putting in is going to handle low-income uh, employees. And then uh, we have, lastly, we're missing our chance to have a nice Olympic-sized pool on park property in the city because our municipal pool on the west side is totally inadequate for the needs of a city of 50,000. And so I'm going to go ahead and make the, the pool as planned instead of the city joining in and putting in a good-sized pool subject to being open to the public in a public park. That's my three areas of concern. Thank you, sir. Did, did that. Thank you. Next up on my list, I have Mr. Ed Hale. Mr. Hale, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Ed Hale, 1005 Oriel Way in Paso Robles. This uh, project directly impacts us because we are directly adjacent to it. I'm a little concerned primarily about a couple of things. Number one is definitely traffic. I drive Creston Road almost every day. It's a disaster. Uh, it's falling apart rapidly. There isn't any real uh, provision to do any improvements due to city budgetary complaints or constraints. Uh, there are multi-unit housing developments going on directly across from Winifred Pfeiffer School, which is going to dump right onto Creston Road. There's another development down at Capitol Hill that will dump onto uh, Creston Road. If you look at the combined traffic between the Olson Chandler and this Beechwood project, it's going to be a disaster. If you've tried to drive Creston Road when school is in session, granted the pandemic has, has stifled that right now, but without the uh, pandemic, if you try to drive Creston uh, Road in the morning or the afternoon when school is in session, it's gridlock. You dump another thousands of cars onto that roadway, I don't care how many right-hand turn lanes you put in and left-hand turn lanes you put in, it'll never, never handle it. Crescent Road dead ends in the 13th Street, which is a two-lane road. There's no way to change that going into town. If you look at that traffic at, during rush hour, it's backed up all the way for a half a mile. The second major problem I have is water. Just a few short years ago, we were on severe water rationing because we had no water. Where has all this additional water suddenly come from. I don't think this has been properly addressed, and I don't think the total impact of these developments has been properly addressed from a traffic standpoint. Those are my two major concerns. Thank you, sir. We appreciate the comments. Next, we have uh, Sophia, and I apologize. I don't know if it's Guz or Guze. Sophia, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am here. It's Sophie Gaze. Welcome. Um, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, I would like to comment about something. Um, somebody mentioned that uh, we didn't have traffic counts uh, from before the, the confinement. And we should have traffic counts, and we do have them, because the old St. Chandler uh, EIR, uh, was having a traffic study with all the traffic counts, I think. So I don't know why 
uh, that person was saying we don't have traffic counts. And also somebody mentioned that uh, there would be new traffic lights and improvements and, uh, and at some point that person said we will do uh, those improvements if they are not done by Olsen Chandler. So I have followed uh, the meetings about Olsen Chandler and I was uh, under the, the impression that Olsen, Olsen Chandler was uh, supposed to do certain improvements. Um, I'm surprised that now it's being questioned, you know, that we'll do them if Olsen Chandler doesn't do them. I mean, when is this going to be uh, approved by Olsen Chandler or by the city or by Beachwood, you know? Uh, this conditional, like, okay, if they don't do it, we'll do it, uh, sounds a little bit uh, flimsy to me uh, when we are talking of uh, road improvements. Um, also, I mean, again, about this traffic issue, this uh, Beachwood project was rejected, was denied a few years ago because a traffic study uh, came to prove that it would be impossible because of the length of the street, the width of the street. Now, the EIR for Olsen Chandler came to confirm that, to say there was no mitigation. You can do right terms like this gentleman was saying, or at the traffic light. We still don't have the width or the length to allow for 5,000 more cars. So how come, Olsen Chandler was a shock to me that it was approved despite the findings of the IRR. So how can 900 more homes um, not bring in even more to that problem? I mean, it, it's, it's becoming a, a huge problem now. I mean, and a problem uh, of, class, uh, of class one, like you, you mentioned. And also my worry is that the two projects will get off the ground at the same time. So we are going to have double impact, double impact on air pollution, double impact on noise, double impact on, on everything. And uh, that's quite a scary thought actually because I live across the project. Sorry, my name is Sophie Guez and I live in uh, Spanish Lakes just across from the beach with development. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and your questions. We will get some answers. Okay, I have Mr. Jacob Allred. Mr. Allred, are you with us? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, welcome. Hi, my name is, oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Allred. I live on 1019 Pioneer Trail Road, right off of Airport Road. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, City Council staff and the project team. This looks great, um, but I, my concerns about traffic, I'm gonna echo what my other citizens have brought up and just state that the mitigation strategies have not satiated my concerns regarding the overall traffic flow for our city. Uh, and more importantly, um, there's no real details provided that help me, who's not a, an expert in traffic study, to understand the overall efficacy of those mitigation strategies. So uh, I, it'd be really helpful for me to, to, to have more buy-in to this project if there was some way for me to digest the overall efficacy, like I said, of those strategies and how they play into the overall strategy within the city, right? So not just Beachwood, but also the other developments on the south end and how those may play in uh, to the overall uh, congestion. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm curious about the airport road, if there will be any kind of thought into that major arterial uh, northbound. Uh, there's already a lot of traffic that comes through there and it's quite fast. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of families that enjoy walking along airport. Uh, so my concern about that would be, um, I would love to see some other mitigation strategies there to help slow traffic through that area, because uh, there's nothing really stopping you except for a stop sign off of Scott. And then the, uh, the last thing I haven't heard about, and maybe I missed it, was any kind of mass transit options through this area, bus stops, that kind of stuff. Uh, what that, what is in the works or plan for that, uh, just to help with uh, overall traffic uh, and uh, getting around town uh, again, I'm, I'm concerned about the overall traffic in the city, and uh, I'd like to hear more about those mitigation strategies. Thank you. Very good. Excellent questions. Thank you for calling. I have no one else on my list. Is there anyone else waiting in queue with city staff? There's no one else on the call in line, sir. Very good. We will close public comment now. Try to get some of these questions answered before the council gets into its discussion. Quite a few of these have to do with traffic, so let's go to those first. Um, I believe our first caller said that you felt that the city's master plan, I assume it means the master, master traffic circulation plan, is dated and inadequate. Warren, can you comment on that? Yeah, I'm going to turn that over to 
Dave Athey, the city engineer, to go over that. But I'll just, uh, you know, start with that the city council did look at a comprehensive update of the circulation element in 2018 that took into consideration all of these future projects, including Beachwood and the Olson South Chandler project. So I'll have the city engineer kind of go a little bit more into detail on that. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Frace. Uh, Mr. Mayor, David Athey, city engineer. So as you can see on the screen there, there is a map of the city and it represents our master circulation plan. Uh, the green lines represent arterial roads. Um, the purple lines are our collectors. And that's important because the arterials are the ones that really collect the major amounts of traffic uh, in the city and funnel those to the uh, even larger roads or freeways and highways. Uh, so the, the idea of this plan is to look ahead uh, in time to say, you know, at, at build out, what kind of facilities do we need to operate at the level of service or the capacity utilization? How much of that road are we using at, you know, at any one time? The higher the, the capacity utilization, the more money we're getting or the more bang we're getting for our buck on our road, our road uh, investment. So as you can see on the screen there, uh, some of those circles indicate future roundabouts, the blue with the black dot in the middle. We have several signals that are laid out, uh, one at uh, Scott Street and one at uh, Meadowlark. The Scott Street signal is actually going to be installed by the Olson South Chandler project. The metal arc signal will be installed by this project when they hit their uh, unit count. Uh, there are other upgrades to the uh, South River Road and um, can I get the pointer? Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, I was going to point at it on the screen for you. Uh, so at the um, intersection of South River Road and Niblick. There are signal upgrades, adaptive signal timing, uh, right turn lanes. Uh, those type of improvements are really meant to decrease the amount of time people spend at that intersection. So it's not, it's not the road itself that really holds up traffic. It's really the intersections that create your bottlenecks. And so that's why our plan is really focused on intersection upgrades, uh, really smart signal timing, smart signal corridors to move traffic at acceptable speeds through that corridor so we can get folks to where they want to go. Now, there are, there are situations in the city where we have schools on various uh, ar arterials like Niblick and Creston Road. Those are going to remain we're going to do everything we can to work with uh, the school district to come up with circulation plans to minimize the impact of their traffic on the city's corridor traffic. However, those will be there. Uh, there will still be congestion with or without these projects. Uh, what we're trying to do with the adaptive signal timing and upgrades to these intersections is make sure that we can clear these out and clear traffic through and improve conditions uh, over time and meet our, like I said, level of service, how well um, this road is performing and our capacity utilization. Uh, so that's kind of like the general overview of our circulation system um, in the city. Okay, so uh, bottom line, we have updated the traffic circulation plan since the date that uh, Mr. Gusson referenced, and these improvements are designed to facilitate traffic flow through that, that traffic circulation plan. There were several uh, concerns expressed about the impact of this project and Olson Chandler on traffic, <coughs> excuse me, along, on traffic flow along Creston Road. And we know that Creston Road improvements have been a big subject of conversation over the last couple of years. What's the plan and vision right now for the coordination of traffic coming out of these projects and utilizing Creston Road? Yes, yeah, so the um, the Olson South Chandler project has a lot more traffic that funnels towards Creston Road. The project traffic from the Beechwood project that we're talking about tonight uh, has more impact on Niblick and Charlet roads. Um, and so a lot of like, for instance, the, the right turn overlaps and adaptive signal timing that's shown on the screen at 13th and Creston uh, primarily is 
the first responsibility of the old South or Olson South Chandler Ranch uh, project. However, if Beechwood goes first, uh, right where Mr. Frace is circling there, if Beechwood go or I'm sorry, if Beechwood goes first, then they would be required to do that. And we've worked it out with both projects that uh, we would have fair share payments between them to make sure that that uh, is equitable and fair to both parties. Um, and so we've really we're really looking at that in coordination. Both traffic impact studies were done uh, almost simultaneously, looking at each other's impacts and how um, how we can coordinate the different improvements and who's going to put in what at the same time. There may be an instance where we have construction going on simultaneously at two different intersections. Um, and there will be uh, some impacts to the traveling public. However, those will be um, those will be temporary. And after the after the improvement is done, they will bring that what we call our level of service back into line of what it was prior to the project. Okay, there was one caller did express concern and some confusion about this. Uh, Who's on first, who's on second, as far as installing traffic lights? Uh, if Olsen goes first, if Beachwood goes first, what if they tie? I mean, how are we, how are we sure we're going to get this done? Yeah, so I think if they tie, then I think the, the site that was required primarily to do those improvements will be required to do those improvements. And, and Mr. Is, Mayor, that mitigation monitoring program that we spoke of earlier, that's part of the EIR process, that has specific triggers for these facilities as well as contingencies between the Olson, South Chandler, and Beachwood specific plan. So we had the same traffic consultant do the analysis and the mitigation measures for both projects. So we've anticipated the possibility that either project could go before the other, and those are built into both of the project's mitigation programs. Okay, I believe the same person, um, I, I'm, maybe I'm, I hope I'm getting this right. Anyway, one of the callers uh, indicated a concern because it was his or her belief that this area, development in this area was previously denied because of traffic concerns. And now that doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, can you comment on that? So there's never actually been a decision on this project since it was annexed to the city in 2004. Um, there was a planning effort that started after that, um, but never proceeded all the way to any sort of decisions. Then we ran into the Great Recession, and basically all efforts on this project ceased at that point. In 2013, the applicant team um, started to revive the project and literally has spent the last six years trying to get to this meeting tonight. Tonight. Okay, another question was about uh, apparently a, a statement was made about uh, having traffic counts before the pandemic. The caller understood us to say that we had did not have traffic counts before the pandemic. I don't think that's what you meant to say, but you tell me. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor Martin, for letting me clarify that. We do have traffic counts before the pandemic. However, they were um, when I what I meant was right before the pandemic so that we have an ac accurate picture we we could uh we could have taken traffic counts however those traffic counts are very expensive um and given the pandemic we did not feel that was you know appropriate to spend money on that uh at that time uh, but but the uh the caller's right we do we do have traffic counts uh for this project and for the uh, south chandler olson south chandler project very good and then uh, one gentleman uh, just seemed to need more details about the mitig traffic mitigation plan and also a better sense of what the efficacy of that plan would be citywide. How, what can we do to um, assure him? Yeah, so the... Um So the level of service and the capacity utilization for the project are discussed in the traffic uh, mitigation report. Uh, it discusses the impacts of at each intersection uh, or corridor. Um, and so it also discusses the, what the mitigations are for those impacts. And by implementing those in mitigations, then the project would essentially bring bringing it back to um, pre-project conditions. 
And so that is the whole idea of the uh, environmental impact report and the mitigation measures and timings that are contained within that. Yeah, I can I can only assume that we have the information this gentleman needs to you know to improve his comfort level. Where do we direct him to to see that data? So I'd be happy to talk to um, the the caller about that. If you'd like to call the city engineer at the city of Pass Robles, uh, 805-237. Uh, 3860. I'd be happy to talk to him about uh, that um, and walk him through the traffic impact report and give him any information he needs. Okay, I believe that was Mr. Allred. So if he's still listening, I hope he uh, follows up on that. Uh, also, a question about concerns uh, of speed along Airport Road. What considerations are you giving that? Yeah, so the, the project is designed with um, uh, several curves in the road. It also has the six foot bike lanes and 11 foot lanes with a center um, median uh, in the road. So it's designed really to make the to make drivers, as Mr. Hammond mentioned earlier, uh, a little uncomfortable when they're driving on the road. And that tends to make uh, have the effect of slowing people down. Um, which is the desired effect we want, because as I mentioned previously, we have a lot of complaints about speeding throughout the city. And so we try to design the roads um, to minimize width, uh, still allow traffic to flow, but also um, you know, keep speeds to the, the posted limits. So the design, design that's being proposed does have some traffic calming control measures built into it. Yeah, that's correct. That's really the center median and the bike lanes and the and the lane widths um, and the, the plantings along the road. Uh, all of that combined really as a uh, as a traffic calming measure. Okay. And then, was there any consideration about incorporating mass transit into this project? Yeah. So we talked to the regional transit authority um, several times about transit. They really they run a process where they respond to demand. And so they don't, um, you know, they, they, they're aware of the project. Um, you know, they, they believe that uh, once it is built and demand is there, then they would, they would provide, you know, either modify their bus route or, um, you know, do, do something different, uh, add a new route something like that to accommodate the new development, but they really can't uh, change their planning or give us any advice until such time as there is demand out there. So if I understand what you're saying, the traffic that we're projecting for this development is sort of the maximum traffic to be expected. And then when and if mass transit comes to serve this area later, that would only serve to improve the situation. That's correct. Very good. There was also a question and concern about this and the adjacent project, the Olson Chandler, basically building out at the same time and the effect of double impacts, not just of traffic, but of, of, of noise, of dust. What's the likelihood that's going to happen? So those are considered cumulative impacts. So we have analyzed the cumulative impact of both projects traffic on the city. Um, in terms of noise, noise is really localized to a point source. So the noise within Olson is isolated to that project. The noise within Beechwood would be isolated there. So those don't have a cumulative effect. Um, in terms of air quality, they both have the same requirements. Um, the big issue really is the dust mitigation during construction. They both have the very um, detailed mitigation measures for dust. Um, the emissions, which is the air quality greenhouse gas, that's tied back um, to the traffic. That's, that is a cumulative impact as well, but that is analyzed and mitigated as well. So uh, all that's been analyzed through both projects, which both have standalone EIRs. Okay, but I'm still unclear. They, they both got their own standalone, standalone EIRs. They both have their own impacts of development. But again, the question is, if they both proceed at the same time, won't that magnify the impact on existing residents? No, because if the traffic impacts are mitigated, whether they build at the same time or separately, if they build at the same time, we'll just end up building the offsite mitigation that much faster, which will offset any increase in traffic. In terms of noise, there, the two projects being aren't right next to each other, there wouldn't be an increase in noise because the noise is specific to each site. 
Um, in terms of the dust mitigation, um, neither project is allowed to create any dust. They have to fully mitigate dust so there wouldn't be a cumulative dust impact either. Okay. And then again, we have a question about water. We went over that in the staff report. I think that the, uh, the drought has really burned itself into the memories of people at Pass Robles. And it's very difficult now moving forward to uh, have confidence in the fact that we have multiple sources of water and more than enough to accommodate build up. Could you go over that one more time, please? Yes. So we have done the full analysis, not only for this project, for the, but for the whole community that demonstrates we have more than adequate water supplies um, for this project, as well as the rest of the community moving forward. There obviously were some issues during the drought. We were um, required to reduce water consumption during the drought. That wasn't actually triggered by a scarcity at a local level. Um, that was a state mandate by the governor. So regardless of your water supplies, everyone in the state had to reduce. Um, during that period of time, we actually brought the Nacimento pipeline on um, project um, into service. So even though we were rationing, our overall water supply inventory increased drastically during the drought. So before the drought, um, we didn't have Nacimento online. Um, we were fine with groundwater supplies even without it. Um, but now we have the Nacimento supply, which is about 6,000 acre feet of year. Um, that's almost all of the water that we consume right now, which is about 7,000 acre feet. And then we have the river wells and the uh, groundwater basin wells, and we have the recycled water. So between all four of those, we are in a significantly better um, position in terms of water supply than we ever have in the past. So we are very confident that we have um, adequate water supplies for this project as well as the rest of the city. Very good. And on the other end of that equation, why are we not building an Olympic pool here? So currently the city operates two pools, one municipal pool and um, Centennial pool. Um, those are currently our pool facilities. Neither are a true Olympic pool, um, but that would be a, I guess, a decision um, for the city council in terms of how they want to adequately or all allocate resources for pool facilities. But right now we do operate two pools. Very good. And then the last question I have is the question about the affordability of this housing. We've seen the breakdown of uh, uh, workforce housing, et cetera. But the point that was made by the caller was that Pass Robles wages are, in most cases, modest. And these houses will not be affordable by people in Pass Robles. Is that accurate? So the the idea with this project is to provide housing for a full range of residents regardless of income. So that's consistent with our housing element. The housing element required this project to provide 100 units. And that was the only requirement in the housing element, which would theoretically meet our regional housing needs allocation. But this project's gone far beyond what's required by the housing element. So in addition to providing the 100 units, which is all that's required by the housing element, we also have a commitment that a portion of those will be deed restricted to low income, which is specifically what the caller was talking about, were units for service workers, and that's what this low income requirement would be. So we would have that. In addition, we have workforce units. So that's basically the income category um, right above the moderate income category. So they're going to design the project where there'll be six, 96 units um, that will be for sale for workforce families. So that's below your market rate um, housing units. And then in addition to that, the market rate units, 53 of those housing units will also have to provide an accessory dwelling unit, which is a second unit on the site that can only be rented. And because they're typically very small in size, say five to 600 square feet, um, their rental rates tend to be in the low income rate uh, or the low income category. We've done some market studies and the state of California has agreed that those ADUs will serve low income category. So between the apartments, the ADUs, and the workforce units, this project goes well beyond what's anticipated by our housing element as the need. And I think that's really what um, we need to be providing for for the community. So I think this project actually has done a really good job in terms of addressing a full range of housing needs. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I wrote down. Did staff catch any that I missed?
that was all that I had marked down. Very good. We will move on now to uh, council consideration. I know there's gonna be a lot of conversation here, so we're probably gonna go around council several times for comments and discussions so that everybody has the opportunity to have multiple chances at this. We have uh, quite a bevy of uh, actions in front of us tonight if we decide to take them. So uh, we have seven different actions that each will require individual votes. So let's start with council comments uh, with uh, Councilman Gregory. Yes, thank you, Mayor Martin. Um, so just for clarification, uh, a question for Mr. Athey. So um, the one caller was talking about whether um, Olson or Beachwood would pay for the road improvements. So there is an agreement in place that one would take care of it. Whoever's first out of the chute would take care of the road improvements and they'd have an equal reimbursement agreement. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, Mr. Gregory. So what, how it actually uh, is set up, either Olson Chandler or Beachwood is responsible for a certain improvement. However, if one of the projects gets there first, then we do have the written development agreements that have provisions for um, funding in case one or the other development has to do it. And so we're trying to we're trying to be fair, and, but also allocate and make it clear who has to do the improvements. So you'll just make sure the improvements happen, whoever's first, right? <laughs> Essentially, that's what we're looking at. Okay. Then um, I'm going to go back to another caller who called in about airport road improvements. I believe that caller was talking about the existing airport road uh, and the potential traffic calming on that road. Does the city have any plans to deal with that, David? Uh, we currently have no plans as part of the Beachwood specific plan for any traffic calming on Airport Road. Okay. We would, we would, um, or the project will be required to do intersection improvements at Airport and Meadowlark, which will include stop signs. Right now it's a free left turn onto Airport Road. Uh, however, as this project moves forward and the frontage improvements are, are constructed, uh, that intersection improvement requires stop, stopping traffic on Meadowlark uh, and improving the crossing at that location because there's going to be a 10-foot or an 8-foot uh, multi-use path uh, there. And so getting people across the street is a high priority, and, and that's the, uh, the improvements that will occur there. And I know, I know for sure that there is stop control at Scott Street and uh, airport, so that will also... Uh, you know, limit speeding. And is that something that the, if the traffic, um, the traffic count bears the necessity, can we put other uh, calming devices on Airport Road north of Meadowark? You know, as time goes on, we could look, the city could look at traffic calming on Airport Road in that section. Uh, we don't anticipate a large amount of the project traffic going that direction. Uh, really, it's, it, it's, um, it's a longer path of travel uh, than using Creston, say Metal Arc to Creston to destinations either to the west or to the north. Um, uh, however, as, as time goes on, you know, Airport Road will be completed all the way to Highway 46. And as that as that's moving forward, we can you know continually look at the road and do traffic calming as needed. Okay. And then uh, I think the same call it brought up mass transit pickup places around Beachwood. Is there anything? I'm sorry, I, I, it was kind of garbled that. Did you, I know it's transit. Did you talk about any places or building bus stops? Bus, yeah, like bus stop like they did at Olson for mass transit at Olson. Is there anything like that planned in the Beachwood area? Uh, at this time, no. Um, we're not anticipating installing any any future bus stops as part of the project. Okay. I would anticipate that it would be like a lot of the other projects in town where we have a a bench and a sign uh, and some red zone for the buses to stop in the future. Okay. And would you could you put up? Uh, I'm going to jump on uh, John Hammond's comments. Could you put up the road design and widths for us? 
that diagram, please. For the court, the, the streets inside the, uh, the project and the arterials both. So this is Airport Road, or are you were you concerned about that, or would you like to look at a different road? Yeah, I like that one's fine. That looks good. So you got eleven foot lane widths, and you got bike lanes. That's that's fine with me. Okay, uh, this is Ridge Road. So this is the road that uh, connects Airport to uh, Beechwood Road. So Ridge. So that's one of the main thoroughfares, and I have the same concern as Mr. Hammond does. I, this is the main. This is the main thoroughfare from Beachwood to Airport, correct? That's correct. It's kind of serving as a collector type road. So, is there a way to reduce the sidewalk path on one side and the multi path on the other side a foot and keep the lane widths at eleven? So, I, I'm experiencing the same thing Mr. Hammond is, and that when Paso Robles waste trucks come along, they're eight or eight and a half feet wide. It does not leave a lot of space for travel. And I think we need to maintain 11 foot width on, on these circulation roads for sure. So I don't know how the, the rest of the council feels on that, but that would be my recommendation, keeping our roads at a minimum of 11 feet lane widths. Is this uh, typical throughout the project, David? Uh, this is the the ten foot travel lane is typical. The local roads that have very low volumes, say less than four hundred uh, trips per day, uh, also have ten foot lanes. Uh, Beechwood does have eleven foot, and that is to be consistent with the current section that is on on Beechwood, and consistent with the previously uh, the previously adopted road standards that Mr. Hammond mentioned. So is a is a six foot sidewalk city standard or is it five? This is neighborhood roads. Um, this is really uh, the, the standard for the city is five feet, but it does not preclude uh, a six foot sidewalk. So uh, if we, want, if we wanted to keep a 11 foot lane on the interior neighborhood roads, we could do that just by, with five foot sidewalks instead of six foot sidewalks. Uh, yes, you could do that. Okay. Um, so those are my comments. I'd like to, I'm going to agree with Mr. Hammond. I've seen too many issues with large vehicles and not enough space on roads. So um, my idea would be to keep the lane widths at 11 and, you know, make the sidewalks a little narrower. Five foot sidewalks still better than a four foot sidewalk. So, um, thank you for that. My, other, my only other comment um, I have is on the grading uh, of this project. I just want to make sure that um, the city council and the, and the uh, citizens who live along Meadowlark Road, especially on the eastern end of this project, have a good review of the grading. So Warren, is there a, what is the process if, if we are to approve the project the way it stands right now, what, what, what do we have as far as ability to control the steepness of the grading close to the road? Well, each one of these sub areas comes back as a small lot tentative map, which will include a precise grading plan at that time. So that will be a public hearing, planning commission, neighborhood review. And at that point, we'll know the exact um, parameters for the grading, heights of slope, um, retaining walls, that sort of thing. So that's when we'll lock it in. Right now, this is kind of the worst case scenario um, that was analyzed in the EIR. So it's likely that some of these grading impacts actually are reduced as we move into the small lot map, which we think the first map that we've seen so far does achieve that. So we'll have some we'll have some input on a design just by design of the exact project. Yeah, the planning commission still will review and approve the final grading. So it definitely can improve from this. Okay. All right. So those are all the questions I have for now, Mayor Martin. I'll, I'll come back a little bit later. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hammond. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
again, uh, I'll, I'll start at the top of my list again for David Athey. Uh, and I think I'm correct here on the Crescent Road where uh, coming into town turns left on Charlotte. You're talking about a stop sign there in the future. Um, why? And I think, as I remember hearing, that would be at the end of the 900 units that would trigger that. Uh, yes, that's correct. And the reason why is we looked at traffic uh, generation from the project and um, in the cumulative scenario. So we're talking uh, 15 to 20 years out in the future that uh, the project as it gets closer to 911 units, uh, we would look at a traffic um, stop sign warrant analysis at that intersection and really take a hard look and see one is it needed and two if it is then we would put in uh, stop signs uh, at that location. Well there there already is a turning left turning lane uh, heading down Charlet. I don't really understand why you would ever want to have a stop sign. There's only one turning movement coming into town that's left. Um, there's nothing to the right. Um, forward straight ahead we're going into metal art. So again we don't use stop signs for traffic calming uh, isn't that illegal to do that? Uh, yeah, in this case, uh, we don't, you're right, we don't use stop signs for traffic calming. In this case, it would be uh, delay at the intersection. So as you're trying to turn left off of uh, or turn right out of um, uh, Charlet Road, the you wouldn't have enough. There's there's so much traffic on Creston Road that there wouldn't be a chance to make that turning movement. And so you use stop signs to allow um, you allow that turning movement that left out off of, of Creston Road. That's really the idea behind that. And until well, that also, time, you wouldn't need it. Well, yeah, but by, by that time, you're going to have a light at Metal Lark and Creston. And you're also still going to have a uh, left turning queue that is huge for you know accumulating cars to go down Charlotte. So, I, again, I, I just don't understand that part of it. And but. Also, while we're talking about this, and you have the slide up, centerline striping on barley grain, a county road, that's a mitigation? Yeah, we had, we had, um, had concerns about barley grain road and the residents there with traffic. Uh, staff, you know, investigated that road. It is a twisty, turny road. Uh, and so we worked with the applicant and came up with an, the idea for centerline striping to um, delineate the lanes and provide, um, you know, provide motorists with that, that visual cue of where they're supposed to be driving out there. I don't understand how we can uh, uh, make that happen with a project on a, on a county area, county road. Uh, is that normal? Uh, when you, we, yes, we would uh, mitigate offsite impacts. That is a normal thing. And how that would occur is that the applicant would go down to the county uh, and submit plans uh, to the county for an encroachment permit. And uh, once that is approved, then it would, you know, it would, it would be responsible for going out and making that occur. Well, okay. I don't understand why we need to do that. Personally, that's county area. Um, the bulb out getting back to there is no design that i saw in the uh, file for the actual bulb outs on beechwood with regard to um projection off the curb line you might say because we've done some really really poor bulb out designs in the city and i don't want that to be repeated either um and this is essentially what i'm thinking is right now near near the park uh with your diagonal back end diagonal parking how far that would project out into Beechwood heading toward the school. And you don't, I don't believe have anything that I saw in the file um, showing the design of that. And I think it's also at not only Ridge, but it's also Metal Arc where that would happen. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so on the screen there, the upper on the upper left hand side, you can see it says diagonal parking lane back in. So that 19 feet that's shown there is consistent with current city standards that that council has adopted for uh, for instance the the diagonal parking on the west side of town that you see downtown uh, that is consistent with that um, with that depth that we have. Uh, okay. <laughs> 
I'm going to draw your attention to the bulb out next to the courthouse then that John Falkenstein did. That was absolutely the wrong depth to do. Um, I don't want to see that repeated. And I'm sure other councilmen would agree that we've seen too many cars hit that. It's just, um, to me, it's, it's not uh, effective as far as uh, design at all. Um, so again, I don't see a bulb out on your plan here, David, at all. Uh, anything shown in this diagram of what that's going to be. So you might want to pass that on to council a little bit uh, to show what your thoughts are uh, with the actual design, maybe a plan view of that, please. I would like to see that. Um, and then finally, Mr. Getting back Mr. Hammond, if yeah. I may um, have the applicant talk a little bit about that, uh, that bulb out and how they anticipate designing it at that corner. Councilman Hammond, this is Dan Lloyd. We've taken a, a long, hard look at that. We have a design, and unfortunately, it's, I don't think it's with us tonight, that we uh, display for the Planning Commission. And we certainly understand the, the, the uniqueness or the, the newness of a back-end diagonal parking. But what we're trying to do with the bulb outs is bring, essentially, the curb line closer to the travel lane so that we create a, a, a visual constriction in the road, which tends to slow people down. Why bulb outs don't usually work is that the radii is too small. And we're not going to be doing a small radii. We'll be doing something in the area of a typical radius of around 30 to 35 feet. That way it'll make it function and feel like a normal intersection that you're going around and not constricted on that right turn or left turn movement, depending on where you are. So. This will come back to you as part of the tentative map for the first phase because Beachwood is going to be part of phase one. We will also be doing the design around the park, so you're going to get a chance to see that. Um, DRC will certainly have an opportunity to look at it too, so keep yourself aware, and I think you'll be able to uh, add some additional comments to that. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And then and finally, again, this is what's going to get me to vote. We're not uh, depending on the, what the rest of the council wants to do. And that's the travel bike lane dimensions. Um, David, I got to argue with you that I remember this discussion vividly with regard to our standard inside the city. And I know that we were talking, I'm drawing my attention back to Sherwood at the time, but um, we set our minimum standard in the city for arterials was to be 12 and collectors 11, as I remember, okay? And the issue here is that we have a right-of-way. And again, this has nothing to do with really the design of the whole project. It's more our right-of-way and what we do with it as far as a design and how we move people, vehicles, and bikes through that section view. This is important to me big time that I don't want to see and again, I'll draw everybody's attention back to um, Marjorie and I drove it the other day. Coming down Crescent Road, you turn left onto Stony Creek. That's where all those townhomes are. That cross section right there is way, way too tight. It is scary, especially at night when you're going down there because you have all the cars parked on either side. So again, I'm talking about street sections that um, have parking um, next to them. Uh, on the curb, so you have you know two parking lanes, and then I have two travel lanes. Um, this is really critical for me that we see you know 11 foot minimum for travel lane have to be, and then with regard to the bike lane being six, I again, if we had tons of bicycles going down there an hour, I would say no problem with six feet, but we don't. And this is again another issue where we're just designing the street for something I don't think we need to at this point with regard to traffic calming, making the lane real tight, is going to create um, a, an accident. I just don't uh, agree with it at all. So again, I, when I have some notes here with regard to street sections that have uh, no parking on them, that I think currently you have them uh, with two six-foot um, bike lanes and two 10-foot travel lanes. In other words, 32 feet across. Again, I would say in those areas, we need to have five, 11, 11, and five. In other words, a five-foot bike uh, lane. Or here's another reason. 
why is it that we have to have a bike lane in the first place? Why can't we just use Charles on that street? That's the main question I had coming up to. So what about Charles? Yeah, so Sharrows, that's a good question, Mr. Hammond. The, um, the use of Sharrows are really for low-speed roads. Um, we're looking at, uh, I think we're talking about Meadow Arc and Airport. Uh, for those two roads, the design speeds are higher than um, was typically allowed for Sharrows. Also, these roads are on our bicycle and pedestrian plan, so um, it, that would be an inconsistency with, uh, with that plan. Uh, and... We have the applicant here. He would like to address, uh, Mr. Lloyd would like to address some of the, the bike lanes and uh, travel lane widths. Councilman Hammond, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, just so that you're aware, we have no strong feeling about a 10 foot travel lane. We can easily go to 11. I appreciate your comments regarding working with the existing right of way that we're showing and making some adjustments in the bike lane if possible and or the sidewalk width in order to maintain a 11 foot travel lane and perhaps make the sidewalk six three five feet instead of six feet we're very comfortable with that and particularly if that helps the rest of the council to um, feel better about the issue we're perfectly perfectly happy with that okay yeah thank you dan i i, I definitely think Again, I'd like to hear what the comments my colleagues have on that because I, we've done some major mistakes in town. I hear about it quite a lot, and I just don't want to repeat it. This is going to be a beautiful community, and, and if we make it travel properly, I mean, it'll be that much better, in my opinion, instead of living without it forever. And, uh, again, we only have so much right away, and I think we can make, do a better job with regard to dimensions on this thing. So, um, uh I don't, yeah, and then back on the Sheryls there, David, again, I think we tried this on Union, or not Union, uh, Rolling Hill Road. We had to take Sheryls off because it was too fast. These are certainly not high-speed roads, so it works into the fact that we, we really don't need to put a bike lane on, a stripe on that street, and we could use Sheryls with no problem. And just, in other words, it's an idea for the traffic um, or person in the vehicle to understand that there could be bikes there, be on the lookout, and you need to share the road. And then again, it just uh, makes the road look a little wider. But the only thing I'm worried about there at that point is they're going to think maybe they can park there too, you see, because we have a, a six foot lane is almost, I mean, a regular vehicle is seven foot wide and uh, you've got six foot. So people are going to think they can park there without signage. And so that's another issue too. So again, I, I'd, I'd like to understand that we can adjust these travel lanes. Uh, to be wider than 10 feet, uh, nothing less than 11 is really what I'm going to want to um, ask for. And uh, I'll, I'll shut up at this point and let the rest of them talk. Thanks, John. Mr. Strong. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm, I'm not going to be asking so many questions as making statements. And uh, that's going to be a long one, but I'm trying to cover a lot of territory. Uh, this was a huge document. It was almost impossible to get through every page of it, but got through a whole lot of it and also went through our old general plan, went through the EIR, went through a lot of things. And these are some of my comments. I know some of the things aren't there that probably weren't considered essential, but I think that they might have been important to have in here. So general plan land use element policy LU2G page LU8 puts a limit on the total units in the combined Chandler Ranch, Olson Ranch, and Beachwood specific plans of 2,370 units, excluding sec second dwellings, with a note that these numbers may be reduced, but no note for any increase. On February 20th, we approved 1,293 units for the South Chandler Olson Ranch specific plan. That leaves 1,077 units for Beachwood and the main Chandler Ranch combined. This plan proposes 911 units, leaving only a maximum of 166 units for the entire main Chandler Ranch area, which is nearly three times as big as the Beechwood area. In 2003, the number of units allocated to Beechwood was 674. This is the number that is proposed today to be raised to 911, an increase of 237 units, or 35.2 percent, more, more than one-third. The existing language is from the city's housing element, not its land use element, which is quoted above. 
In the land use element amendment area, the entire text relating to combined maximums and exceeding projected build out not to exceed 44,000 population is gone, as is the text related to the underlying purpose of specific plans within a general plan, including, quote, retain unique site features, unquote, such as its iconic hills and oak trees in immediate proximity of the hard south edge of the city where lower density is most, appro most appropriate. That last item goes along with the missing item D, which said, quote, allow for flexibility in site planning in order to encourage creative and higher quality design and to ensure compatibility with surrounding land uses, unquote. Also, the above moderate income category homes are proposed to be increased from 550 to 658, an increase of 19.6%, while the low and very low categories are proposed to be decreased from 120 to 100 units. And you can see EIR page uh, Roman numeral four point Roman numeral one dash nine. And that's a decrease of 16.7%. A moderate income category is added of 174 units that did not previously exist. These changes are proposed as the plan grades away the most desirable, quote, above moderate locations on the property. And the city seeks diversity in its placement of low income housing. So uh, that, that, that worries me. That brings us to a grading plan that destroys the most iconic twin hill features on the northeastern most parcel in the plan and the ridge between the recorded blue line stream and an elementary school, which was adequately addressed by, by the, the uh, developer. But, but the two hills way up at the north end could provide some of the finest above moderate income home site at less cost and high return to the developer with a better neighborhood patter, pattern for both existing and future residents of the area. There are many other relatively flat areas that would better accommodate low and very low income residential units closer to high volume traffic ways, shopping and schools, as well as more distant from agriculture in the unincorporated area. Now the low point on this property is at 822 foot elevation. The high point is at 906 foot. The high point is nearest the county agricultural land with the smaller 882 foot hill to the north of it. Most of these hills are only 2,000 feet south of the Werewell Creek outside the city limits. While the geologic base rock of Pleistocene, non-marine type, is generally found throughout our entire area, the soils on this site can prevent some very present some very difficult challenges. Most of the site is the Nascimento Los, Los Osos complex at 9 to 30 percent slopes. The high clay content with a high shrink swell potential and is hazardous for erosion. A narrow strip of land running north northeast to south southwest is only two to nine percent slope but has such a high shrink swell potential that it has severe limitations for building sites and roads due to low strength of the subsoil. Foundations, footings, and road beast base need special attention to avoid structural failure or very high road maintenance potential. Soils in the far northeast corner of the property are the Arbuckle, Arbuckle San Ysidro complex at 2.9% slopes, but have to be carefully analyzed to determine whether they are mostly San Ysidro or Arbuckle, as, as the former has severe building limitations for both structures and roads, while the latter is structurally better. There is some Arbuckle Positus complex soil on the 9 to 15% lower hill in the northeast corner of the property that is well suited for building if attention is placed to the type of base used in the road or structural mm -hmm. foundations. <clears throat> now, it will be critically important for the developers to pay attention to the limitations of the site and not abuse the land formations to any great extent for the safety and long term viability of what they build. These things should never be taken lightly, nor entered into lightly, nor carelessly. And to do this, EIR page Roman numeral I-32 
says to bring in 20,000 cubic yards of imported fill that would allow less cuts. I'm very concerned that portions of this plan have been designed more with uneducated profit in mind than the well-being of our community and our neighbors. Densities for total numbers of units can be stretched if done in strict conformance with state law regarding low and or moderate income housing. I'd like to see uh, the areas to have certain requirements waived reveal their 30 year deed restrictions before we just approve this on a handshake. I need to see the same for a viable homeowners association to properly maintain the final product. A homeowners association, hopefully that is modeled more on the ones that are currently exist at Quail Run or in Sierra Bonita. Those are working very, very well. And you can really get bad homeowners associations if they're not done right. Now, our water rationing was not required by the state. We didn't need it as we had plenty of water. So that really isn't a major concern of mine. I have been working on a private sector grant to greatly improve our traffic throughout the city at no cost to the city. We can't say more now at the request of the donor who is planning millions of dollars of assistance to us. I'm not concerned with traffic as long as we also continue our efforts at the regional, state, and federal levels for the funding to build out the traffic mitigations. Projects will take about 20 years for this to actually build out. And factually, the banks aren't going to finance building that won't sell. It won't sell unless we have enough demand. So I, I think the concerns about all of this cumulative impact happening initially before we can actually do something about the traffic are, are le really red herrings. Now, I try to champion proper property and other rights, but I can't condone abuses of those rights by the taking of another's rights to enable a selfish desire. That goes both ways. Residents have rights and so do property owners. And we need to pay attention to both in this. So well, those are my comments at this point in time. And I'll probably want to talk more about some of this later. Thank you. Okay, uh, does the applicant have any comments about the councilman's concerns? Um, Dan Lloyd again. Well, we're always concerned about councilman comments. Uh, but what I would think I would offer here is that as the development proceeds with a tentative map, that those issues be evaluated by staff and policymakers at the time. Thank you. Councilwoman Garcia. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think with the calls that have been um, and the traffic mitigation concerns, and I do remember being at a lot of the meetings about the traffic concerns. And I would have to agree with uh, Councilman Hammond and Gregory about the traffic. Just we already know that there's going to be impacts, but I believe we just need to focus on how we're going to fix the the traffic flow as far as it being safe and being able to move through um, safer and quicker. Um, so that would be definitely my concern to uh, make sure that that they do go at least 11 and five. Um, traffic's going to be big, but um, I think we can. That would help. Um, that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go along with the 11 foot roads. Also, I want to preserve the bike paths, though. So if we're going to compromise on that, um, I, I would do that rather than the sheriffs, because I do think the speed's going to be an, an issue here. I'm just going to list some of the concerns that I heard uh, uh, discussed here. I'm, this is by no means a complete list, but it'll give us a way to start focusing and honing down the conversation. There was, of course, the 11 foot road widths. Uh, Councilman Hammond had some concerns about the turning and the stop sign at Charlet. Uh, an issue about the barley grain striping, which I guess my concern would be, other than the cost of the applicant, does the county want us to do that? And then the issue of the design of bulb bouts. Um, the, um, the issues raised by Councilman Strong were uh, quite numerous and varied, uh, ranging from land use element restrictions on development in these areas, the balance of the number of homes being built in the three specific plant areas in this neck of the woods, 
and also various soils and grading issues. So let's start at the top again and see if we can start focusing in on these issues and where we wanna go with this. Councilman Gregory. Uh, thank you, Mayor Martin. So uh, <clears throat> I'm in favor of the 11 foot vehicle widths and then maintaining bike, bike paths where we can. But I think those 11 foot widths should continue into the neighborhoods as well. So uh, where we don't have bike paths, we have at least 11 foot of travel. Um, I just, uh, on the, the bulb out um, issue, I think that's something that we could address at the time they design and build that portion of it. And um, <clears throat> I, I think the backing in idea is an interesting idea. It's nice for the park because you unload into the park from the park side instead of the street side. But I agree with Councilman Hammond that the bulb out has to be properly designed. And so I think we should leave it up to the engineers to make that work for us. Um, the only item, the other item I'd like to talk about on uh, is as long as we have, as a council, we have the power to, um, not power, but the option to help out on the, the final grading issues. Um, uh, I don't know about the, the hills and things like that, but I'm more concerned about the final grading closer to Meadow Lark Road. I think that um, sometimes these hills you can try to work around if you can, but that's something that's going to have to be up to the developer with getting approval for the final grading plan. So I think uh, the issues on the grading can be dealt with on a project by project basis, but I think we need to uh, make sure we look at those items. Other than that, I think uh, I like the traffic, the overall traffic plan presented by David Athey as far as the traffic flow. I think that uh, Joe Fernandez has done a good job on how, to, how we deal with that traffic impact over the years. Um, I don't have a lot of other issues with the project. I think it's a nice project, but I think it's important to keep the roads wide enough for us to get through. That's my comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, real quick question, I, I, I wrote it down, I didn't talk about it, was oak trees. Uh, again, this is passed at the Oaks, and we always talked about uh, trees. We know there's going to be some that are going to have to be sacrificed, but uh, staff, do we have a count on oak tree removals and and what we're saving? Yes, we do. Um, let me bring that slide up really quick on oak trees. So you got a total of 100 trees currently on the site. 82 will be preserved, which are the high value trees. Um, a lot of those are kind of in this cluster here on this hillside that we're preserving. Um, there's 18 removals. Those are shown with the X's in it. The vast majority of those trees are in declining or poor condition. So we did walk the site specifically with the arborist and the project engineer and really identified which trees needed to be saved. Um, we made some changes specifically in here. There's three really nice trees here um, that work as an entry feature. So they actually redesigned the project to save those trees and traded it for these two trees that actually were in poorer condition. So I think that's an example of the kind of design that went into the oak tree plan. Well done. I, I, I agree. That's definitely something I think um, marginal trees that are going to be built around and going to cause a danger to uh, people and houses in the future need to be taken care of now. Um, it looks like percentage-wise, a uh, majority of the trees are, are going to be um preserved and actually enhanced you know which is really important with oak trees is to sometimes you trim them and they look light nicer they're they are just a better uh, you know if they're maintained so that's that was a question i missed earlier was trees um getting back to again the streets again i'm, I'm hearing the council's kind of on the same page with regard to making our uh pathway travel lanes a minimum 11 feet. I'm going to address Airport Road, though. And um, David, I, I, I can't remember the old section of Airport Road uh, down there. I know we narrowed it with striping, but typically that I think that section across Airport Road to the north is pretty wide. And what I'm worried about is that's going to be a major thoroughfare um, in the future to get 
from north to south and vice versa. And what I'm concerned about now is airport through this section of Beachwood, we're getting it again down to 11 feet, you see. Um, I'm gonna say maybe we should uh, talk about this section to be 12 feet with five foot bike lanes, you follow? So in other words, um, I would I think you would call this as a collector, I believe, uh, or no, this the airport is what you called as an arterial. So uh, arterials, I believe, need to be as wide as possible to move as many as we can. There's no parking on it. There should not be any major reason to slow in this section down. It's more straight. Is that correct? There aren't as many bends and curves in these uh, in airport road. That's correct. This section of airport road doesn't have that many bends in it or, or curves. Exactly. So it's, it's designed to, to put a little more throughput of uh, vehicle traffic through. So I would recommend, at least in this section, that we, um, again, make these 12-foot lanes with a 5-foot uh, bike lane, which is our standard in town. I think this is going to be more closer to what Sherwood is. You see what I'm trying to do is, is keep a consistency to uh, high flow traffic uh, arterials that we're going to be relying on moving a lot of vehicles through. And especially when you've got the sound walls on either side of this, it's it's going to be more of a, um, a faster or more quicker kind of a, a movement through this section of the road. There's not many homes on either side. So um, again, but in the majority of it, I think this is the, the street design can be discussed in a tentative map process, which Dan Lloyd um, mentioned. I really want to make sure that we have that opportunity to um, make our part of the right of way as best possible. Again, I have no issues with the actual flow and the design of the actual Beachwood uh, lot selection and design. It's, I think it's beautiful. Um, but moving people and cars is what's important um and i don't want to get it too darn tight because i keep looking back at stony creek and, and those other sections where it's just too darn tight people are going to get hurt we're going to have a problem i keep thinking of 12th street where we did the uh, mitigation for the runoff and stormwater that every time i drive that bothers the heck out of me too now forever not everybody else i know in that section um is, is a bothersome with it that's another question and that kind of comes up though david do we have um stormwater design because this is a again a new law in california do we have in our designs of beachwood uh, stormwater retention and, and just like we had to do on 12th street built into these designs Yes, so the project will mitigate the stormwater from the lots themselves, and they will also have a stormwater mitigation for the roads. And so each of the cross sections have that built into them. Yeah, I thought I, thought I saw something there where the, the sidewalk and you got a, like a, a parkway or something there. Is that kind of what you're talking about? And again, Getting back to that is, and I noticed this the other day on one on Spring Street there at uh, 21st Street with regard to maintenance. We're getting a lot of weeds in these kind of um, areas where we said it was, you know, going to be a stormwater retention. But the problem is it's more of a maintenance issue. And I'm thinking now of the CFD that's going to have to maintain all these parkways with all this vegetation and the cost of, in other words, are we making it as economical as we can to uh, for the cost of the people there? And we're talking, you know, $800 a, uh, a year, but is that going to be enough? Or are we going to be having to ask more because of the design that we have going on? Uh, yeah, so those, the uh, improvements that you had mentioned on 21st Street and 12th Street are really first generation stormwater uh, improvements. And so the city and the designers around the country have learned a lot since that time, and we'll be making sure that the applicant designs a robust, but uh, as you say, economically or economical to maintain uh, improvement uh, that you know gets installed. But we, it, it's kind of a balancing act. We always got to balance compliance with state requirements uh, and federal requirements uh, with uh, the need for an easy and cheap to maintain or inexpensive to maintain uh, facility. And with all the trees that I see in this plan and this slide, obviously, um, 
I'm, I'm hoping again that we've learned a lesson on the type of trees that we want to plant that are not um, heavily, you know, they don't tear up the sidewalks and then they don't shed a lot, of tree, a lot of leaves and a lot of maintenance, that kind of thing. I'm assuming we've learned a lot with requesting certain species of, of trees within a, a development like this. Yeah, so we have a approved uh, street tree, median tree, and park tree list, and so the applicant will be required to to choose depending on location the type of tree to install. So, for instance, if it's a a parkway, we have approved trees for parkways. Uh, that's the that's the the strip of land between the sidewalk and the um, and the gutter. Uh, if it's a median uh, out in the middle of traffic, we have different trees for those, typically London Plains. Uh, so we have, a, we have a whole, I guess, quiver of tree arrows we can use to, to plant in those areas and make sure that they don't uh, cause that damage you're referencing. Okay. Yeah, that's another thing that just popped in my head. So, again, the biggest issue, if we still have a, a, an open door to design our streets within our right-of-way, not asking more uh, land from the developer, but on the other hand, redesigning our interior, which Dan Lloyd mentioned that they're happy to discuss, then I, I can certainly approve uh, my vote for this. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Martin? Yes. Uh, just for clarification for John, I believe that the uh, HOA is maintaining the roadways and the uh, sidewalks and everything on this plan. Is that correct? That's the CFD, though, Steve. That's the thing, and the cost of it, I think, is is what I was getting to. Uh, they're asking eight hundred and some dollars from every landowner uh, in the development to put into the CFD to maintain all this. And my question is: Is it designed well enough so we can stay within our budget? You follow? Eight hundred fifty dollars, right? See, so you got that um, element going into it. I'm concerned that you know how we've done this before where we keep um, asking for more. And then if, if for some reason they voted down, then we don't get the money that went <laughs> You see, we're getting into that same issue. And, and this is the first time I believe maybe staff can ask this or answer regarding the CFD. We haven't done this in a long, long time. Is that correct? Where this uh, new development is paying its own way within the city? So uh, just to clarify in terms of how maintenance is gonna work. So the Community Services Facility District, the CFD, um, basically takes care of the off-site costs, police, fire, um, but includes the community park. Um, the landscaping and all the local streets within the project area are going to be maintained by the Homeowners Association. So that's an additional cost, you're right, um, that's passed on to the homeowners that they'll be responsible to. So obviously we want to make sure, you know, the designs are such that it doesn't overburden homeowners. Um, the city will be responsible for the major road, um, which is Airport Road, and then the existing frontage roads, which is Creston, Beechwood, and Meadowlark for maintenance. So, Warren, then, uh, I don't want to step on Mr. Gregory, but the point is, the HOA, do we have any way of, of uh, controlling the HOA and how much they uh, charge their people to take care of the cost, or is that within their own purview that they have to do? Um, well, the development team has some projections in terms of, I think, what HOA costs. Obviously, that's a major component in terms of selling houses, so they are very um, incentivized to keep that as low as possible. I think um, Andrew Fogg could probably enlighten us a little bit more on how the HOA costs are going to be calculated and distributed. I was going to say, the uh, this is Andrew Fogg, again, uh, the attorney for the uh, development team. Generally speaking, the CCNRs and organizational documents are reviewed by the city attorney prior to those being approved, and there can be provisions in there that uh, restrict the ability of the HOA to take costs out without uh, the city's approval. So that'll be an obligation that continues to run through in the, uh, in the HOA documents. So, okay. And, and well, Anthony, what happens if the HOA falls apart or, in other words, um, you know, how everybody, again, doesn't get together on those things sometimes, uh, it falls back on the city because uh, the way I see it, is there any kind of a hammer or any kind of a, a, of a language in there that um, the HOA must do these things uh, and not the city? 
yes, these will be affirmative obligations within the HOA documents that'll be, everything will be reviewed by the city attorney uh, before the documents are finalized. It all goes through a process with the state uh, Bureau of Real Estate as well. So these things are looked at. They are, again, there'll be provisions in there that restrict the ability of the HOA to say, we're not gonna do that. Uh, it's an obligation and those sections of the CCNR's HOA documents can't be removed out without the city's consent is the way these would typically be set up in a master plan community where the HOA has committed uh, to doing this work as part of the approvals. Again, the HOA is gonna be established by the um, developer uh, group, both a master HOA and then uh, sub HOAs for intract uh, developments, but all of those are gonna be set up before there are uh, residents here that everyone will come in knowing what the obligations are. They'll be projected out from a fiscal standpoint. And again, there'll be safeguards to make sure that those obligations are in place and can't be removed uh, without the consent of the city. I don't know, Dan, if you wanna add any more. Dan Lloyd, again, just one comment. Um, we discussed whether or not we wanted to have a CFD taking care of these improvements that we're now talking about an HOA doing. We felt we had more control over a budget dealing with it as an HOA rather than a CFD itself. So we think that there's more control by the HOA to get the right kind of pricing and result by exercising their control over these particular items. And remember too, and remember too, that the budget has to be approved by the state. So there's, there's limits to how thin or how streamlined an HOA can go towards uh, these improvements. Okay, all right, well, that's fine. I don't wanna get down in the weeds too deep, Dan, but uh, you know how things go sometimes. And if everybody starts fighting, the city's gonna be the one that loses, I know, at the end. But um, again, I, again, I, I don't have a major issue. I'm sure you guys have done your due diligence on the design of the agreement. So uh, we're good to go, I think, so. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Strong. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I agree with the road concerns, by the way. Uh, the housing, the HOA, actually, it has to include the developers during, uh, during build-out. Until build-out has occurred, they've got to be actually involved in it. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to work. And the north boundary of this development is a hard city limit with agriculture beyond. There is no sphere of influence concern involved in that particular area. So that area needs to be larger lots and avoid big retaining walls. The existing residents and new ones both need to have a natural setting and some buffer between the city and the county's agriculture. These hillsides, or hills by the way, would be great sites for some of our oak tree inventory to be used for large lot landscaping and hillside stability. Also, in the slow cog uh, letter on the uh, EIR, that's the arena numbers were explained, and that's on page four, dot L-9. And I'd like to quote that briefly, especially because I'm the president of, of uh, Slocog. Regional housing needs plan, that's Slocog's 2013 plan. Section 5.1 of the housing element cites regional uh, housing needs allocation requirements for the Beachwood area as 120 units at a minimum density of 20 dwelling units per acre for low and very low income groups and 550 units at a minimum density of three dwelling units per acre for above moderate income groups. The allocation for the Beechwood area plan area cited in the housing element is based on the Slocog April 2013 RENA plan. The 2019 Regional Housing Allocation Proposed Final Plan, released in August of 2019, indicates an increase in housing needs for the region and the City of Paso Robles between 2019 and 2028. By the way, this letter was written at a time before all that was finalized. It has been finalized, and that is the case today. And we have need to pay attention to that because it's very important for, for a lot of different things having to do with our city as uh, our council should know. Thank you. That's all I have. 
Thanks, Councilman Strong. Could I ask a question just briefly would help me out a little bit? Uh, you, sure. You've cited a lot of sources and a lot of concerns, but I think what uh, I'm trying to distill down now is do you, are any of your concerns deal breakers? Things that I'm sorry, I'm just this is just a no go for me. And no, the things, no, they're not. I, okay. I think the okay. big important thing is way off into the future on that lot F or area F and those hillsides. Okay. I think so, those are beautiful landscape areas. They're beautiful views and they're great buffer between the hard line of the city and the agriculture of the county. We should not put high density right next to our hard line boundary. Okay. That's just good planning principles. I, I heard you uh, uh, state concerns about the housing mix. I mean, obviously you have a concern there, but that's not a deal breaker for you. No, no, that, that can still be adjusted. We can adjust some of these other lots and move, move things around a little bit as, as this goes into into the more final phases. So you're, you're talking about adjusting things at a later point in the process then? Right, but I really think that we have to consider it and make note of it now so that it's it's on the agenda as we move forward. Okay, and then your concerns about soils and grading, is that something that would be handled at the uh, track map level or the um, tentative map level also? Those are going to be handled there and at the building permit level and at the inspection level. Okay, so not, because, yeah, not necessarily a point for concern tonight unless the majority of the council wants to give direction there. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Garcia. Nothing from me, sir. Okay. Uh, I want to beat a dead horse here. Let's go back to Steve. Anything new, Steve? Mr. Gregory? Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm back. You hear me now? Yeah, we're going around again. I want to make sure everybody gets talked out here. Anything new from our last go around? No, I think I'm ready to make a motion whenever, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, John, anything new? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. I'm ready to, to make a motion as well. Fred? I'll listen to the motion. Okay, and Maria's all already said she's out with the discussion, so I'm gonna bring it back to Steve and give him first crack at a motion. Okay, for clarification, um, Warren, I just need some advice on this one. So for the lane widths on the roads, is that what? What uh, resolution do we need to mention that in? Yeah, so all the design and lane width standards are in the specific plan, so that's resolution C. So if you want to set minimums of 11 foot for all local and collectors and 12 foot for arterial, include that in your motion on resolution C. C or D? Specific plan is D. Yeah, so I think um, there was a, a, in your staff report, it's not lettered correctly. So I'll direct you to the screen. Um, that's the correct. Um, okay, yeah, it's different from what I have on my agenda here. Yeah, okay. we, 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 we didn't get the ordinances um, specified correctly in the staff report. So go off what's on the screen. Very good. Okay, Steve, back to you. Hey, just move that screen on me. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so I, I move that we approve resolution A, certifying the environmental impact report, adopting the environmental findings, a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and statement of overriding considerations pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. Second, but with no discussion. Hang on, I have a motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Discussion, Mr. Hammond. Yeah, actually it would be, uh, I believe Warren wouldn't be option three when, when we're doing a, a minor change. Um, at least that's what it shows in the other um, staff report. Option three gave us uh, opportunity to change minor things, which is what we're doing here, I think. Yeah, I think option two, option three are basically just the same overall action. It's just in option three, you would make minor changes within um, any of these resolutions as you move forward. All right, that's what we're doing. Okay, 10-4, second, go ahead. Any further discussion, Mr. Strong? Mr. Strong? I'm not hearing from Mr. Strong. 
We'll come back. I'm Ms. Garcia. I'm trouble with my mute button. Oh, my there you are. Okay. I know. Okay. I have uh, I, I, I'm in agreement with that. I still would like us to make sure that we red flag the grading plan and make sure that uh, some of those amenities on the edge of this project are feathered out so that we don't put high density right next to our county lines. That's all. Okay. I, I don't believe I understand Mr. Trace correctly. That's involved in Resolution A, however. Yes. Am I correct? It's a, involved in number three. Thank you. Okay. Uh, discussion, Ms. Garcia? No, sir. Very good. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Um, Steve, you got to keep going, or John, you want to pick up from there? No, I'll keep going. Okay. Uh, I move to approve Resolution B, approving the General Plan Amendment 12 004. Second. Motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Further discussion, Mr. Strong? No, except for that density right on that north edge. And uh, I don't know if that's really affected by the uh, uh, general plan amendment. Okay. Ms. Garcia? No, sir. Thank you. Roll call vote. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Merton? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, I move that we introduce for the first reading by title only Ordinance A, adopting the zoning code amendment 19 01. Second. Motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Discussion, Mr. Strong? Yes, I'm wondering now, is that incorporating our discussion here? Did we discuss uh, motion? Did, you, did we discuss changing application of the zoning code? Is the maker of the motion there? Yes, I'm here. So um, that's a question for Warren. Warren, if, if how do we incorporate what Fred wants to do here? So it sounds like. Mr. Strong has been discussing the idea of reducing the density on the eastern fringe of the property, um, which would basically affect um, the specific plan. Um, these areas right in here, I think, is what we're talking about. Um, so if that would most likely be something that would have to be incorporated in the specific plan. Um, the specific plan does allocate certain densities to all these parcels. Um, so that is kind of a foundational issue that is somewhat complicated to um, deal with at, at this point. So um, my only commentary on this is that the whole eastern border is a open space. Open space. The whole <laughs> way down, is one little section there. So, yeah, I don't know. There even even where the hill is that he wants, where he's concerned about the grading, there's an open space area on the east side. So, you're comfortable with the motion, Jim? Well, not the lower hill isn't. The lower hill isn't open space. I understand, but on the east side of it, there's open space. There's that PG&E easement. No, that's, that's the higher yell. I understand, but it, it does go into that portion of the project that you're concerned about. I don't know if this- Okay, all I want to see is more large lots on there and don't take that thing down and make it flat. Okay, well- I can't support that uh, the, on the second. I Again, I think- I agree. Get into the weeds of trying to redesign this project, and again, um, I don't believe it's necessary. Okay, so I'm hearing the maker of the motion stand fast as with the second. Yes. Uh, uh, very good, Councilman Garcia. Any further discussion? No, sir. Thank you, Fred. Do you have any parting thoughts before I call for a vote? 
No, I'll just have to vote no, that's all. Understood. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? No. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes four to one. <laughs> So I move to approve resolution C adopting the specific plan 19-01 to in also include uh, traffic lanes on arterials to be a minimum of 12 foot wide and the remaining lanes throughout the project at 11 feet wide. Second. By Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman uh, Hammond. I would like to ask the maker if he would also add that where possible bike lanes should be maintained. And I would agree to that, and where possible, I commit to be maintained. Are you good with that, Mr. Hammond? Yeah, by maintain, you mean still uh, striped yeah. to delineate that space? Right. As opposed to Shiro's. Right. I, yeah, that's what I thought you meant, so I don't have a problem. No. Excellent. Okay, further discussion, Mr. Strong? Well, my only question is, uh, in order to uh, stay consistent on my previous vote, am I going to have to vote no on this also? Maybe Mr. Frace can tell me. Uh, yeah, I, I think that if you're concerned with changing the density on the perimeter of the site, um, the issue remains the same. Also, we've got a clarification request from the applicant team. They want to just clarify that these changes in lane width are within the prescribed right of way. So we'll just be adjusting sidewalks and bike lanes to accommodate the wider lanes. Is that correct? Exactly. We're not, yes. yeah, and not asking for any more uh, property from uh, our right of way. Yep, that's correct. Let's pay attention to the maker on the second. Yes. Anything else, Fred? No, sir. Thank you. Councilwoman Garcia? Nothing now, sir. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Gregory? Aye. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Councilmember Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? No. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes four to one. I move to approve Resolution D, approving Oak Tree Removal Permit, OTR 19-05. Second. Second. We've got a motion by Councilman Gregory, and I'm going to give the second to Councilwoman Garcia this time. Go. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one in a row for me. Uh, uh, so let's do uh, additional um, discussion, Mr. Hammond. None. I already asked about the oak trees. I'm good to go. Thank you, Mr. Strong. No. no. Okay. And I'm good. So let's go for a roll call vote, please. Council Member Gregory. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Council Member Strong. Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. I move to approve Resolution E, approving the large lot investing tentative map, track map, TR-3160. Go ahead, Maria. Second. <laughs> there you go. Motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilwoman Garcia. Further discussion, Mr. Hammond? None. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strong. No, sir. Thank you. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. The final motion on this is to introduce for the first reading by title only Ordinance B, adopting development agreement 20 05 between the City of Paso Robles and the Beechwood Owners Group. Second for Hammond. Motion by uh, Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Further discussion, Mr. Strong? Nope. Ms. Garcia? No, sir. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. I think we're through with that one. Mr. Martin? Yes, sir. I'd just like to compliment uh, again Warren Frace and his staff. 
we're doing an incredible job on these. This is another specific plan that's so detailed and so complex. And uh, I just appreciate everything that he and the staff has been doing. And Dave, everybody, so thank you. I think we all echo those compliments. We appreciate the hard work yeah. from all quarters. I think absolutely yes. input from the community has been good, and I think that our um, our discussion and our analysis of this event has been exhaustive, which was what was required of us. Okay, let us move on to item number fifteen: approval of an urgency ordinance adding Chapter Seven Point Five Zero Camping to Title Seven Health and Sanitation of the Municipal Code. Mr. Mayor, the presentation will be made by Chief Lewis. Can you hear me? This is Kimberly. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I started talking and then I heard you. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I must have gotten muted somehow there. Uh, so my apologies. Um, so the, e the item uh, on your agenda this evening is to uh, adopt an urgency ordinance that adding chapter 7.50 to the municipal code. Um, the item really stems from the work that you're all familiar with that's been going down on in the riverbed. Uh, as you may recall, the council authorized proceeding with cleanup of the riverbed and primarily in large part due to the fire concerns uh, and hazards that were happening. And a lot of that involved cleaning up the encampments and proceeding in consistent with the council's uh, adopted procedures to do that with providing notice. Uh, you've heard a lot about the Martin versus City of Boise case, which uh, was a decision that basically held that uh, a city could not enforce their anti-camping ordinance and make it basically a crime to sleep or camp in pub on public property if there weren't shelters available. So uh, as the riverbed to clean up encampments are, are moving forward uh, and wrapping up, uh, we want to make sure that the city has the appropriate enforcement tools to to continue that work and so that you can try to keep the encampments from settling again. So uh, this provision would add the Chapter 7.50 to the health and sanitation section of your municipal code. It would define camping and camping-related terms uh, and prohibit camping in areas lands owned or operated by the city, land zoned as open space, high fire risk areas, and water supply risk areas. Uh, and as noted, this is uh, to be consistent with the Martin v. City of Boise case, which obviously the city has already been following. Um, but this codifies that practice, um, but also does have a qualifier that it, it, you can't enforce um, if there isn't an al available alternative shelter, uh, but that not if there's uh, exigent circumstances, such as a high fire danger or danger to water quality supply like you have in the riverbed. So it would still allow you to enforce in the riverbed. Uh, and this comes about because your current uh, ordinance, you do have provisions prohibiting camping and on public places, but it's in the zoning code uh, and it's just, it's very general and hasn't been updated in, I think it's about 20 years now. So uh, it doesn't have the same uh, protections and procedural safeguards that we wanna make sure we have in there to have an enforceable ordinance. Uh, so that's why we're proposing to add this to chapter 7.50 regarding health and sanitation uh, as opposed to the zoning code. And so we would still be following up with a subsequent action uh, to initiate consideration of the zoning amendment through the appropriate process, including review by the planning commission, uh, but didn't want to delay doing that here. And the reason for that is set forth in the urgency findings um, that you have, uh, which again are necessary to update the ordinance to ensure continued enforcement in line with Martin v. City of Boise while allowing the city to enforce illegal camping and high fire danger areas like the riverbed. And so uh, the findings uh, highlight the, the fire danger that you all are very aware of uh, with, uh, I think it was in June 2020, there were 45 total fires that occurred and many more for that, 115 in 2018 and 95 fires in 2019. 
and it's well recognized that Ill illegal camping activities can generate a lot of those uh, those fires. So uh, we have also learned that with additional concerns uh, with danger to the city's public water supply as a result of illegal camping. You have the Ronconi Well, uh, where the city has is pumping water uh, from the Salinas River. And as you saw in a lot of the photos and materials that were provided uh, when we were reviewing the encampment, uh, encampments and the need to clean those up. Uh, there are a lot of makeshift toilets and disposal of hazardous substances um, in the riverbed, which pose a significant risk to water quality. So that this ordinance would identify those areas um, as uh, no camping areas. Um, so those are the basics of the ordinance. Um, so the recommendation before you this evening is to adopt an urgency ordinance uh, adding Chapter 7.50 to the Health and Sanitation Code of the Municipal Code. Um, you have uh, also on the line with me this evening is my colleague, David Ferrucci, uh, who did a lot of the laboring work on this ordinance and has worked on this not only for Paso, but also for other areas in the state. As you can imagine, uh, other communities are grappling with these same issues and so working on similar uh, code amendments and um, Notably, uh, before going to law school, David actually graduated, went to and graduated from Cal Poly's uh, planning school so in San Luis Obispo. So he is also familiar with the area uh, and what has been going on. So I asked him to, to join me when we got to this item uh, in case there are some more specific questions that he may be able to answer more readily. But with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I would note since it's an urgency ordinance, it does require a four-fifth vote. Very good, thank you. Questions, uh, Mr. Gregory? So, <clears throat> Kim, Kimberly, so this just uh, um, solidifies, solidifies our ability to do what we're doing? Yes, yes. So this allows you to continue enforcing, uh, but it does recognize the Boise case uh, and those caveats. It does also have a qualifier that exigent circumstances would still allow in, in those particular areas. Uh, to enforce the no camping prohibition. And our, the one I, the one thing we have to do is offer uh, some kind of shelter for folks to go to, correct? So you, the shelter requirement in Martin v. Boise was uh, when you're enforcing the ordinance with some sort of citation or criminal means. So the Martin v. City of Boise case said that um, it was cruel and unusual punishment to cite somebody for sleeping on uh, basically in the park when there wasn't a shelter available. And they had pretty extreme facts in that case where um, they knew there weren't shelters available. And so that was the real issue there. So you still can um, enforce, but you want to make sure there's some shelter available. Um, but we also wanted to build in some added protections for certain areas that were, you know, would likely be off limits uh, in most circumstances like the riverbed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Yeah, you know, Kimberly, um, I guess in layman's terms, is this, is this basically saying that the city now has to provide uh, facilities, you know, toilet facilities and that sort of thing? Uh, what exactly no. is our obligation then? No. So this, this ordinance is just targeted only to uh, – it's basically in the new section saying similar to what you already have, no camping, but allows some of the caveats to make sure we stay within the constitutional bounds that were set out in Martin v. City of Boise. So all this says is that you can't criminally enforce um, the camping, the camping prohibitions, uh, which are laid out in the ordinance on public land and in these areas that are high fire risk in that um, but if there's no alternative shelter, including a publicly provided campsite, hotel voucher, or similar accommodations, then you wouldn't be allowed to cite people. So it's, it's Martin V. City of Boise was about the citing, but this in no way requires you to then provide uh, additional facilities or uh, toilets or things like that. This is about enforcing where people cannot camp. Well, that's perfect. That's exactly what I, I would hope that it, we would be talking about. Again, I. When we went to this uh, Borky Flat uh, location, it was, in my mind, a location that we could tell them they could camp legally. Um, and I've, I've gotten a lot of comment about all the facilities that has grown up down there with regard to um, uh, port potties and, and shelters and 
all these extra amenities that I had no real uh, thought of even providing. It just it's there now, right? And it's costing us almost what nineteen twenty thousand dollars a month for all the services that we're doing there. And again, the idea was to provide a space that would meet the letter of the law that says they cannot be in the um, in the in the uh, riverbed. Which again, this is another part of that. Which and I agree, we definitely need to do as an urgency ordinance now. But um, I mean, there's another, we're getting off off topic again regarding the Borky Flats, but um, you understand that when I try to do that, it was not really wanting to provide them with all of these services and all these amenities. Again, it was just a place for them to go, bottom line. So anyway, thank you. That's really all I have. Yeah, well, and just to clarify, so the Borky Flats is a little different, though. It does provide you added uh, protections as you do move the encampments out because there are other issues that aren't just the Martin B. City of Boise. You know, there's obviously due process concerns that can come up and, and challenges with the new, you know, with the health orders and COVID-19, as you heard during that process. So that was, that was a, I think, a special circumstance related to those temporary transitional activities. Um, this is a long-term one, though, to help you, you know, going forward uh, with the uh, prohibition on camping. Um, but with the, with the, uh, you know, the exceptions, I guess, that you, that we would need to make sure we, we don't get in trouble under Martin v. City of Boise. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Councilman Strong. Yes, and Kimberly, here's here's the next question. What we're really doing then is we are saying nobody is allowed to intentionally take an action that will harm themselves or harm others, because those are the specific things we're calling out. And if they already are using that area as shelter, we don't have to use provide with them with any more shelter than they have already acquired, do we? No, this is ju the ordinance just says where they cannot camp. And then it's a, with the exception that if there's no shelter available, uh, available shelter and there aren't other exigent circumstances, then we can't basically cite somebody for camping there. But that's the limited okay, exception. But, Otherwise, it specifies the camping prohibitions. That's, the ordinance is just targeted at pro prohibitions on camping. Okay, but available shelter could be an equivalent shelter to what they already have. It doesn't have to be more shelter than they already have, does it? Oh, correct. Yes. Yes. So this is that, that's all that's you, know, you understand. All I want to mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Councilwoman Garcia. Yes, sir. So when we say we're a uh, citation, so uh does that mean they get ticketed and then they have to pay a fine? So I, I think the commander may be able to answer how they, how it comes into play more practically. But yes, yeah, so this, and I think that has occasionally been the practice when need be. Usually it's just you try to get um, those that are camping in inappropriate spots to, to cooperate and explain why they can't camp there. And then they move along uh, in certain circumstances. I think in the past they have occasionally had to cite somebody and it's like an admin citation uh, where they may pay the fine. Um, there are a lot of caveats to whether that actually occurs or not, but um, that is that can be the process. And, Okay. All right. Thank you. Chief Lewis, Chief Lewis is here on the line also, and it's, I can answer that question. So, yes, typically fines are associated with any type of citation that we give. However, often judicial discretion, depending on the type of citation that we give, comes into play. So oftentimes um, judges uh, realize that these folks don't have much means to pay for their citations. So they um, take other actions such as suspending their driver's licenses, which oftentimes they don't have. Um, but they, um, in the judicial system, they tend not to criminalize uh, much of this activity. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. We have a couple of people who've been waiting very patiently for public comment on this item. So let's go to our public comment line. Hopefully the, uh, hopefully the public comment group has not been muted. First one on the list is Daniel Monahan. Da Daniel, are you with us? Yes, I am. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to read a brief statement. Uh, my name is Daniel Joseph Monahan, and I live in the river. Uh, how was it that we homeless people came to the river uh, can best be answered, I think, by the Pastor Robles PD, Ty Lewis, 
it was a directive by the police that sent us down here to get us out of the city. Now, that happened with me with an officer Martinez three years ago when I wound up homeless and came to the river because he told me to go out of the town, stay, stay out of the town, out of sight, out of mind. Now, this in regards to the fires you list on the uh, ordinance, you list three fires that uh, were 15 acres, 11 acres, and three acres in total, which is uh, 29 acres or an average of 9.6 acres of fire. Now, the math on these claims, these are misleading, and uh, the math proves this by an average of a nine-acre fire with 95 and then 45 being 140 fires. That would be a total of 1,260 acres burned. There's only 680 acres in the river. So there would be a black strip from south of Paso Robles all the way north. There has not been that many fires. They might have had calls to where they responded to somebody saw a campfire, but they never got out and fought a fire. Now, uh, from these three fires, we know that one was started by a homeowner that was looking for gold in the river. Another was started by an individual that was visiting the river. And the third was a city worker with a weed whacker. Now, I think the homeless is least likely to start a fire, you know, than a, a, a homeowner trying to pay his property tax or someone from the city with a weed whacker and a zero attention to detail. CDS states that there's 103 fires a year in the state of California. It's caused by camping. Now, that being the case, 95 fires in 2019 were started in the river in Paso Robles by camping issues. Then that leaves only, what, eight for the rest of the state? These are all inflated numbers that are lies to try to admit that the homeless, be it a problem that we are homeless, but, you know, it's more of a kind of like the gentleman said earlier, a place for them to go. Is that like a place where they had the Native Americans go on the Trail of Tears? I mean, when do we get the blankets with, uh, you know, yellow fever? You know, we're not a problem. We're not an issue. We work very hard down here. We work with the police, you know, uh, there's there's nobody down here that, you know, isn't trying to get their life back on track. And, you know, we're considered a thorn in the side. I, I don't understand it. Now, in the beginning of the meeting, you had COVID updates. Commendations awarded for saving lives. I believe Captain Strong made a comment on how saving a life, there's no greater thing than that. How are you saving lives by removing individuals' right to social distancing and placing them in a two-man tent with another stranger, you're effectively increasing the chances of an individual contacting COVID, a disease that takes lives. Sir, that's so why are we now? That's three minutes. Can you summarize, please? I'm just, I think that we can work together with the homeless down here, and I think you can pass your urgency or until the end of this uh, uh, pandemic. And then if during that time, we can work together to move everybody out of here in, in a peaceful way. You know, I, I, I keep fires from happening by having a griddle. You know, I spent the money for it. And there's people down here with money that can do the same thing to prevent fires. I just feel that it's kind of like a, you're trying to push us into an encampment like, you know, the Japanese in World War II. Gotcha. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Yes. Our next caller is Brianna Aldridge Alvarez. Are you with us? I am. Welcome. Can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my name is Brianna Aldridge Alvarez. I live up in Heritage Ranch, and I'm here today to speak for Aurora Williams, who could not be present tonight. I'll be reading a letter written by her. Dear Mayor and Council Members, I addressed the City Council on July 16th, 2019. I was here to address the topic on fires in the riverbed as they related to the homeless living there. I'm sending this letter to you to highlight some thoughts and ideas related to the same. Paso Robles is a beautiful place to live, as is most of the Central Coast. However, we recently made national news for some not-so-beautiful issues. Mason Lira, National Guard presence to ensure peaceful protests, and the arrests and charges of Siana Ariana. <laughs> 
I would hate to make national news again for some decisions without looking further into other solutions. Today, you as city council are considering whether voting on increasing local ordinances will solve the homeless and trash problems in the riverbed. Creating a no camping ordinance will not solve the problem. Atascadero has a no camping ordinance and they have homeless camping in town. They also have a sign on their city hall doors directing people to pass the robles to sleep at the tent city that you have erected. I see an opportunity here to make national news, but in a positive way. I would encourage you to take some time to investigate options, perhaps creating an ad hoc committee to meet with and collaborate with county agencies and nonprofits, which serve and support people with mental illness and substance issues um, to find a better solution. Collaboration and compassion been creating another barrier for homeless with mental illness and addiction problems to try and navigate. If we are Paso strong, we should seek solutions, not roadblocks, not barriers, and not picking our fragile people while they are vulnerable or are well young. And that concludes the letter. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. I don't have anyone else in queue. Does, does staff have anybody else online? No, sir. Very good. Close public comment. Break it back to the council. Uh, Chief Lewis, you want to address the um, question about people being directed to the river? Thank you, Your Honor. No, there's never been any direction by the police department or any other uh, city department that I'm aware of directing homeless to stay in the river. In fact, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last several years uh, doing our best to um, keep people out of the river um, to prevent rescues by the fire department during the high water times and the rains and then in the summertime to reduce um, burning. Uh, in addition to cleanups of the hundreds of tons of waste and trash that are down in the riverbed on a regular basis, uh, dealing with wastewater um, to deal with issues of diverted water uh, down in there to form baths and so forth. So uh, it's been an ongoing challenge for the city as well as the police department and the fire department to manage that. Uh, we uh, encourage people to try and find housing. Our CAT team works diligently and effortlessly with various county and city agencies to uh, remedy the situation, which remains elusive at this time. Of course, we have ECHO as a partner. Uh, we work with Paso Cares, all of which is to find people housing, uh, keep them out of the river as much as possible. So that's not an accurate statement. Thank you. Is Mr. Stornetta available to comment on the number of fires and their causes in the riverbed? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor Martin. So in regards to the caller's remarks, in regards to a majority of the fires are not started by campfires, I will correct him and say that the majority of fires in the riverbed are started by campfires. I would also remind him that even though he's using a griddle to barbecue or cook his meals in the riverbed, that no fires are allowed at all in the riverbed, whether he has a griddle or not. Um, we do did have the accurate numbers there are there for the last three years. In the last three years, we had over 427 fires in the riverbed. We do not document fires in the riverbed where our people do not get out of the fire engines. All of those fires were active fires and our crews had to in engage in extinguishing them. And that should have answered his questions unless you need any other information. That's good for me, thank you. Do we have somebody on staff that can comment about the issue of social distancing in the encampment area that we've established? I can try and do that as well. Uh, so yeah. we do provide tents to those uh, folks that were interested in staying in the rookie flats. Uh, we provide those. Uh, to my knowledge, we're not forcing multiple people into tents this time. Uh, as I think we've reported to count on many occasions at the most. We have three, four, five, six people uh, that will stay at any given time within the confines of the campground. Uh, it's not an internment camp, as was described. People are free to come and go to safe parking spots. Uh, we provide restrooms and showers, and of course, uh, everything is open. We provide security to ensure that people feel safe there. Uh, we've worked with local groups to um, 
meals uh, to do our best to make it inviting um, so that people have a safe uh, place to stay. Unlike the riverbed where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have drug and alcohol problems down there, as well as ecological concerns and safety concerns with fire and safety. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, Chief, my understanding is that um, when uh, people check into that encampment area, they're provided with a tent and a sleeping bag. Is that true? We do have sleeping bags and have tents um, to provide those that are interested in staying. My understanding also is those materials have gone missing. Theft is in a problem uh, at the uh, site, uh, which was uh, unfortunately uh, it was predictable. Okay, and we've had other damage and vandalism at that site also? Yes, Your Honor. Is that right? Sorry, we might be breaking up a little bit. That's correct. Yes, we've had that. Okay. And, uh, and, then, and then as far as assistance, I understand that we have had groups come to assist at the encampment. We were doing feeding down there for a while. I understand that there was a, a, a syringe exchange group that was down there trying to help these people out and, and other groups. Is that true? Yes, sir. That's all true. Okay. Um, before I uh, before I turn it over to the council for their comments, I just want to let everybody listening in that to know that um, when I first got back on the council um, some years back, uh, one of the first issues that was brought to my attention was the issue of homelessness in Paso Robles. And uh, we immediately started pulling together resources to address this involving local people, Paso Cares. We set up a, what was called a MASH event every year to provide uh, a common place for uh, all county services that serve the homeless to be in one place at one time so that these folks could get the help they needed all at one place in one time. Uh, we've had mental health people involved in this. Uh, I've, I've served on the Homeless Services Oversight Committee at the county level and their committees. I know Councilman uh, Gregory has also done the same. Uh, we continue to have uh, interchange with our Paso Cares folks and with our ECHO folks in Atascadero, trying to uh, use the resources that we've managed to put together to most efficiently serve the needs of the homeless. Uh, that is not to say the problem has been solved or is anywhere near being solved, but I wouldn't want anybody walking away from this meeting thinking the city just has not tried to do anything. Uh, in addition to all the, um, the uh, services that have been provided on Borky Flats as an alternative encampment area, we've also provided overnight security. So um, things have been done. Is the problem solved? No. But uh, have we tried? Yes. Council comments. Mr. Gregory. Um, I think um, we're, we're really trying to get permanent a facility to give people a warming center we could send them to, and we're getting closer and closer to that. This is a good interim solution. And I think that everybody's done a good job, police department, the fire department, and the CAT team and ECHO and Paso Cares. We're all trying to help with the issue with what we have to work with. And um, I think we need to just keep forging ahead and we're gonna soon get to a point where we're gonna have a facility. We just have to keep moving ahead. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I only a real question I was going to add for Jonathan was, uh, you know, we've had uh, many instances where we've had to do swift water rescue at great expense with helicopters and risk and danger to our firefighters. Um, I don't know how many times we've had to do that in the past, but it's, it's too many. Um, again, I you know I opinion with this uh, ordinance and, and urgency that we're protecting the Roblins. Again, it's an issue that we need to take action and, and make, have a strong hand. I'm sorry to hear that Tascadero has a, a sign on their door saying, come get them back up to pass Robles as if uh, these folks are our folks. Um, again, it's just a, a sad situation that we I think as a city are willing to give a hand up, you know, to, to get them out of where they are, but not a hand out. And that's the point. I think any Roblin here that I've talked to would do that. But we've also got to protect our interests, too. And this is uh, ordinance is certainly going to be 
uh, a for forward step in, in camping uh, that we need to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond, Mr. Strong. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, this city has always been a caring, feeling, uh, outreaching city. And the people here care about each other. Many of these people were born and raised here and just have fell on really hard times. Uh, the cost of housing here has gotten out of sight. That is causing problems. We have many, many problems to deal with, but we have to look at these people as well, who they are. They're human beings who need us and need our help. At the same time, we have to give them the kind of help that, that is, is good for both them and us. We can't let anybody harm anybody else in the process, and that's the purpose of this ordinance. This isn't to disadvantage them. It is to take them out of a situation that, especially as we move toward the autumn and the, and the winter months, becomes a very dangerous place to be. Uh, uh, John mentioned some of the problems we had in trying to rescue people out of that river, and some of them didn't even want to be rescued. And, and that, that, that's very sad and makes us feel very helpless. This is a hard time for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. This is one of the few ways we can move forward and have them be able to help themselves and us give them as much of a hand up as we can legally and, and economically do and recognize the fact that, hey, they are part of our citizenry also. So let's just do what we have to do and move on. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Garcia? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I am in the health industry and I have been doing that for 30 years. And um, like Mr. Strong said, you know, this community is very giving and uh, we have Paso Cares here and we have Echo and uh, Julie's put a lot of hours and Steve Gregory and everybody's been trying to figure out proper ways to help but we also have to maintain the health um, part of this. You know, when we saw the pictures of, you know, how much trash is down there and um, feces going into our water, I mean, you know, we have to have some kind of regulations to be able to, to keep the, the health aspect of this. So, you know, I'm all for helping people, but... We also have to think about the whole community um, and the help is there, you know, and uh, we're always willing to help, but they need to um, to be able to, to help themselves as well. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you. Um, those are the council comments. We've had public input. Uh, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion if you would. Please. All right, to go ahead and introduce by title only and adopt urgency ordinance number 20 triple X and urgency ordinance of the city of council of Paso Robles adding chapter 7.5 camping title seven and health and safety and sanitation to the El Paso de Robles municipal code. Second. Motion by Councilman Hammond, second by Councilman Gregory. Further discussion, Mr. Strong? No, sir. Ms. Garcia? No, sir. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Do we need a motion to direct staff for the zoning amendment? Uh, no, we do not, Your Honor. Okay, we're good with that. Very good. We are moving forward then. We are at council business and committee reports, starting off with Councilman Gregory. Um, I would just like to uh, thank um, our people who we honored earlier this evening with the proclamation from Chief Ty Lewis. Exceptional um, effort that people put in to keep our community safe. Our dispatchers, Randy Harris, our sergeant, the police department. <clears throat> They're all incredible people working and giving their giving their lives up in favor of trying to save somebody else. It's very 
very admirable. And I just want to continue the praise of our police and fire department. This has been one of the toughest years I've ever seen in our community. We're firefighters going all over the state. Put a lot of pressure on our chief, both chief of police and chief of the fire department. And I just want to say thank you to those folks and everybody who supports and works on those departments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Uh, council reporting, um, they had a APCD meeting, uh, nothing really to report. Uh, our IWMA and along with the airport commission was uh, moved to November, uh, meetings council this month. Um, on the issue that I wanted to bring up uh, with regard to our city council meeting of September 15th, and that was item 15 where we were talking about actions to further reduce and prioritize operating costs. Um, I made the mo or I think I second the motion, Mr. Gregory made the motion and we had Maria uh, also vote for that. Um, since that point, again, I've had some discussion with staff that they were not entirely clear. If, if we could, I'd like to see if um, maybe we can get Mr. Frucci to um, give us his interpretation of what we actually made a motion of. And if it's not clear enough, maybe we should bring this back for further discussion or agendize it to another meeting. But Tom, do you have um, a comment on what you were directed to do uh, at that point? Uh, yes, sir. Through the mayor, the motion on the 15th for item 15 was to direct the city manager and the department heads other than the fire chief and the police chief to work together uh, and analyze potential additional budget cuts and to bring those back if any were developed in January or, or early February along with Mr. Cornell's analysis of the revenue and expenditure performance during the first six months of the year and his forecast for the remaining six months so that the council have both the information on the fiscal status at that point, plus if any additional ideas were developed um, and needed, potential additional actions the council could take. But there was not to be any uh, budget cuts considered or brought to council in either police or fire. Okay, and I, I in, in a way, when I, in my mind, just to throw it out when my thought here, and I don't want to get into full discussion, but the fact though, in my mind was the frontline police and fire. In other words, our officers in the street and our firefighters in the engines, those are the people that I was talking about. But if there's other places within the departments that might have some cost savings, uh, personally, I would like to at least be able to discuss that. I think Councilman Gregory's uh, motion, the way it was written, was pretty um, bold that we would not touch anything within those two departments. And again, I, I would even ask the directors of those departments that, you know, if there's any cost savings anywhere that, you know, that would be something we would want to put up on the table just like any other department. But again, um, that's my thought. I'm not sure what the rest of the council, you know, that voted for it had, but if we need to get into this, uh, Kimberly, you know, with regard to further discussion, again, if it has to be agendized, I'd like to propose if anybody, you know, wants to do that, we can, we can bring it up. And I'm not sure how many of us have to agree to do that for another agenda item on another day. So, so I'm, I, if I may, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing this is going to turn into a real discussion here. So I'm, I'm thinking it's going to have to be agendized. Mr. Frucci? Uh, the way I'm operationalizing the direction of the council, I mean, we are always, given our fiscal situation, we are always looking in all departments for potential ways to save money. So the way I'm operationalizing the motion is to continue to do what we always do, and that is to look for ways of saving money. For the past five years, the departments have consistently come in significantly under their budget allocations because they seek to save money wherever possible. So we wouldn't do anything different from how we've been doing it up till now in all departments, but we would wait until at the very earliest, Mr. Cornell comes to council with his six months of fiscal analysis. And 
I can tell you so far, based on where we are this year, he's feeling very positive that we're in fact we're doing better than the budget uh, would indicate. So I would recommend we continue as we are, that we continue to implement the council budget reductions that have already been approved by council, not put st uh, staff under stress to do anything different from what we've already been doing and will continue to do to find ways to save money and bring back to council the six month fiscal analysis. And that, at that point, the council could then say, okay, either things look um, good enough, let's continue as we are, or the council could say, based on what's happened since then, we need to look at other items in which, in which case we could bring those back to you. But I think um, if the council's okay with that, that, that's the best approach. I don't think we need to re-agendize this in order to uh, continue going in the direction we've been going. Okay, I, I, I wish the motion had been stated that way, but that, you know, if, if we all know what the saying about wishes is. But anyway, um, I, the other, the other uh, feedback I received from the community was it was interpreted by many that we had authorized um, cutting uh, uh, recreation, cutting library. People had just people had just took our motion to mean that we were cutting all that out, and I don't know how to re-deliver that message now. Tom, that was not the direction that you're taking, is it? I do not believe that was the direction I was given, nor is that the direction I'm heading. No, sir. No, I don't, I don't recall that either. So, I just obviously getting some clarification here and treading very close to the line. Uh, Fred, comments? Well, yes. First of all, on that matter, uh, I, I I understand that, but I don't think the public is even listening. Most of them aren't even listening to us at this point in our meeting. Their items are all gone, and they've they've turned us off, and they've gone to bed. So I do think this should come back onto our agenda just so that we can reassure the public that we are not out here trying to find ways to cut their services. We are fine trying to find ways to save money. I think that <coughs> clarification is essential that we that we bring it back and, and have that discussion. Thank you. Councilwoman uh, Garcia? Yeah. Oh, well, wait, I I, think... I'm not done. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you, you gave me a beat of silence there, Fred. I took I took. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, on that matter, that's how I feel, and, and I hope this comes back. Okay. <clears throat> but I do have things to report on. So in the past three weeks, I've been very busy, mostly responding to our citizens about their concerns. However, I did spend one day in morning and afternoon meetings on the state level, <clears throat> pardon me, to discuss the league's potential position on Proposition 19, which has been greatly modified since the league gave it an endorsement. The new version would be a disaster for our city and county, although it could help the real estate industry. I advocated for the league to not take any position pro or con on the new Proposition 19. Also, in our case, I think the real estate industry should thrive without it. The league has not as yet taken an official position on the proposition. <clears throat> Pardon me. I also participated in multiple White House briefings on COVID-19 with very strong support by Dr. Fauci regarding both new rapid testing and a vaccine. He stated that the fast track of Operation Warp Speed is not due to any shortcuts or lax testing. It is due to some amazing technological advances that keep all of the safety while greatly reducing the time to get through the process. He was very firm about the safety and the effectiveness of the new procedures and products. Those most at risk will be the first recipients very, very soon. And the rest of this week will be heavily taken up by me with regional, state, and national board of directors and voting meetings on a variety of important issues. And that's my report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. John, let me cycle back to you. You brought up a point for reconsider, possible reconsideration, but you might have more to your report on activities, or, or were you done? I was pretty much done on my activities. I just, uh, I think uh, we really need to put this to bed, whether we're going to want to re-agendize or not. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll get Maria to weigh in, and I'll, I will, and then we can go from there. Maria, your report, please. Yes, sir. My report, uh, I attended the 
Slow County Oversight Committee. <clears throat> I also attended the Cap Slow uh, monthly meeting, and I attended the uh, the Mayor's Diversity Panel. We had our Zoom meeting, and I also attended the Diversity uh, Events Committee uh, meeting this month. Um, that's all I got so far, sir. And do you feel with the clarification the city manager made on the previous motion that it needs to be reconsidered or are you clear on that now? I'm clear on it, but uh, Mr. Strong, I just want to say that, you know, all this is being uh, recorded and people can see this on YouTube. So I think the clarification, as long as we make that clear, um, that we definitely were not looking to cut anybody or whole departments who are just looking to see what, you know, what each right. department, their list of things to cut. Yes, sir. Gotcha. Thank you very much. For my activities, I uh, attended the specific plan ad hoc committee, um, uh, participated in the elected officials COVID report, which we go do every week, uh, attended the uh, Economic Vitality Corporation board meeting. I participated in a recorded panel discussion for the League of California Cities Conference coming up this week on complete street projects. I attended the uh, uh, Homeless Service Oversight Committee Encampment Committee meeting, uh, participated in our Small Grants Committee meeting this morning as we continue to distribute to care money to local businesses. I was on sound off on KPRL today, and I attended the County, Channel County's Division Board update meeting via Zoom today. I have a couple more points, but I want to settle the uh, the motion issue first. With the motion uh, clarified as a city manager stated it, I'm okay without rescheduling it if he is satisfied that, that he's got sufficient direction from the council on that. Mr. Gregory, your feelings? Um, I concur, Steve. I, uh, Tom stated the way I meant it, so I agree with what Tom said. Okay, John, you're good. I'm good until again, first of the year when we uh, get more important data on second quarter uh, results. Right, and, and Councilman Strong has stated his position and, and I, I respect that. And Councilman Garcia has stated hers. So it seems that the majority of the council is happy with the clarification that you made on the motion, Mr. City Manager, if you are happy with it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, members of the council. Very good. I have a couple of other things that I did want to bring up uh, with the, um, uh, ballot issue pending in front of us. I'm having more and more inquiries from people about city expenditures and revenues and how that is done. And I, of course, I always direct them to the city website where we have all of our documents, all of our budget information. And I go there myself to research those things. Uh, and it occurred to me that, you know, a person who doesn't do this all the time, even though I think the reports are very clear, might have some difficulty finding some information. I'm wondering if it isn't possible to install what I'm referring to as a uh, budget button page, where we could basically have links to specific things that we receive questions about a lot. For instance, you could push a button and you could basically uh, get a message on how much money the general fund received last in the last budget cycle, or how much we spent for uh, uh, public safety services in, in the last cycle, or how much money we've spent to date on the roads. I know all that information is there, but I also know the people that contact me don't have time to plow through it. They want to be able to push a button, get an answer to a question. Please understand, I know that there aren't enough buttons in the world to push for all the questions, but I think that we could easily put a page up with the 10 most asked questions, and those could be changed as time progressed. I think it would be very helpful for people seeking that simple information. The other thing is there were comments early this evening about um, the efficacy of the uh, warrant register. And again, this is a report that has page after page after page of um, expense items. And sometimes the companies are not familiar even to council members and um, perhaps a, a, an, an invoice number and a date. But uh, it's very difficult just looking at those entries to see, oh, well, that money was paying for this or that money was paying for that. I'm wondering if it's possible to sort this report down so that the entries could appear in, in blocks under our uh, general fund categories and under our enterprise fund categories. So we would see a list of warrants of uh, expenses that were incurred for XYZ department during that time period. So it's not just one endless list of 
items, but something somebody could look at and get a, a comparative idea of how much money we're spending in each category. Would that be a possibility? Uh, Mr. Mayor, there are a variety of ways we could do that sort. Uh, why don't uh, Mr. Cornell and I talk it through and we'll come back to the council the next meeting, maybe with a example to s see if that serves the council's needs better. Very good, I appreciate that very much. Uh, one more go, one more go around uh, with other comments, Mr. Gregory. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Warren if he wants these nice notebooks back. <laughs> Yeah, we'll take all those. We tend to reuse them. So if you want to drop them back um, by com dev, that'd be great. Mr. Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I saw the letter that uh, PR Protect sent to you and direct uh, comment, very detailed questions. And then I really appreciate your video response, uh, which I, I would encourage all Roblins to, to listen to because it was very concise, very well done. Uh, answering uh, important questions that they brought up. And so, again, I just want to compliment you. That was a great idea to use the video YouTube to uh, respond. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I want to make one caveat on that report. I have received some feedback. I made the comment on the report that we had a citizen's oversight committee already in place, which is, in fact, the case. We have a committee that handles uh, the oversight on our, our street expenditures. But uh, some people took that to mean that just that committee would be the oversight Mayor. committee for, for um, uh, the issues that are being considered on J-20. I fully expect that if J-20 passes, we're going to be either adding to that committee or establishing a separate committee for people who are interested in those issues. So, um, uh, but I do appreciate the, the fact that you saw that you thought it was well done. Councilman Strong, any final thoughts? Oh, not really, Mr. Mayor, except that you know, the one thing I've noticed is that the public doesn't seem to understand what we're talking about a lot of the time. And I don't know how we're going to make it simpler or, or educate them without seeming like we're talking down to them uh, as to what we're actually doing and how much we care and what we're really trying to do. Uh, I know that they don't understand our finances and how they work and how they function. And, and I, I'm at somewhat of a loss as to exactly how to get this across. And maybe it's just that social media doesn't really care. They're just interested in griping. So, well, I, if I could make a couple of suggestions, I think that um, we've had very good success in the past with the Paso Talks series. Uh, we had a lot of people show up to get information during Paso Talks. And more importantly, we had a lot of new faces, you know, people we don't usually see show up to get information about the budget and about public safety. So. I think reinstituting that and doing that consistently would be very, very helpful. I think making great the, idea. Uh, again, great I think idea. I think making the budget and the way we spend money easier to understand. You know, uh, we we get used to looking at these budget forms and looking at these register reports, and eventually we kind of get the hang of it. But if you're only doing it once a year, it can be very confusing. So the more we can do things like a a budget button page so we can get basic information out to the public quickly. The more we can resort those warrant registers so people at a glance can say, oh, this is how much the money the, the city spent on public safety last month. That will incrementally help inform the public and those that want to be informed. And we're, we're all different people. Some of us have a greater need to be informed than others. But for those that want that information and want to assimilate it, we need to facilitate that assimilation. That's just my it's their tax dollars that we're spending. They should know. Absolutely. Our thoughts, Councilwoman Garcia. Yes, sir. I totally agree with uh, with everything. Um, I also saw your video and I have been sharing it. And um, I was talking to um, Mr. Tom Frucci earlier today, and I was trying to figure out a way that we can get that same information out, uh, maybe in Spanish. Um, I also received your the email, so I'll be sharing that as well uh, to my email list. But it it was great, great questions, great answers, well done. And like I said, I've been sharing it as much as I can. Um, I think people do want the information and maybe just don't know where to get it or how to get it. But I think as long as all of us are still out there, uh, sharing the correct information, I think that's the important thing to do. I agree also, and I, and I agree also on the, the need to have greater penetration into the Hispanic market with translation. 
Unfortunately, I am not talented enough to do that. So if there's someone that could assist me with that, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would welcome it. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. City Manager, is there anything else for the council tonight? No, sir. Very good. Upcoming events, library board meeting Thursday, October the 8th, 10 a.m. Senior Citizen Advisory Committee meeting Monday, October the 12th, 1.30 p.m. Pass Rebels Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee meeting Monday, October 12th at 4 p.m. Planning Commission meeting Tuesday, October 13th at 6.30 p.m. And our City Council regular meeting will be Tuesday, October the 20th at 6.30 p.m. The deadline for submitting items for that regular meeting is Wednesday, October the 7th. With that, if there's no further business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Motion by Councilman Strong, second by Councilman Gregory. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all for your hard work. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. Thank you.